Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. Directors of America's top intelligence agencies testify on worldwide threats today. They will appear before the House Intelligence Committee. Top of mind, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Russia's threat globally. You're looking at a live image of Kyiv, Ukraine's capital, where it is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is a special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Also this morning, President Biden will announce a ban on Russian oil imports in response to the invasion of Ukraine. We will bring you the president's remarks live when that happens around 1045. But the morning starts with the House Intel Committee hearing on worldwide threats. And North Korea, Iran, cybercrime, domestic terrorism, all are fair game as House members question the heads of the FBI, CIA, NSA and others. Of course, we're now in day 13 of Russia's attack on Ukraine and a shift in global relationships. So we'll preview today's hearing and we'll also get the latest news from Ukraine over the next hour. Let's start on Capitol Hill with correspondent Rhonda Colvin. So Rhonda, first of all, how significant is it to see these intelligence heads appear on Capitol Hill in public today? It's very significant, Libby. It's significant because of the timing with the Ukraine conflict and that situation going on. This is a, a, a highly anticipated hearing. It happens every year, and it's a chance for the heads of all of our intelligence community. You mentioned uh, the FBI, the CIA, the Director of National Intelligence. They will all be in front of this House Intelligence Committee and discussing the worldwide threats, just as the name of this hearing is. They prepare an unclassified report. They have been coming to the Hill to have these type of hearings once a year since 2006, and they're also going to be in front of the Senate Intel Committee later this week as well. But it, it's extremely important because, as you mentioned, Ukraine will likely be uh, top of mind for many of these senators, or many of these House members who will be questioning these witnesses. It's also significant because it gives the public a chance to hear about what our intelligence community deems as a threat, what regions are concerning to them right now. Cyber attacks will likely be brought up. And and if you look at some of the past hearings uh, that uh, this House Intelligence Committee has had on this subject, uh, it usually does give you a forecast of what type of threats are coming. For instance, I looked at uh, the transcript of last year's hearing and uh, Russia mobilizing troops uh, around Ukraine, that was brought up last year. And of course, we know uh, that's the situation that we're all looking at right now. Also in the 2019 report, it was mentioned that we and the world were not uh, likely ready for any sort of strains of influenza that could turn into a pandemic. That was in, in 2019, so a full year before we knew about our first case of COVID-19. So this is a, a really important hearing that happens annually, uh, once a year, and the basis of it is a report prepared by uh, these agencies to deliver to Congress. And as I mentioned, uh, later this week, uh, the Senate counterpart of this committee will be hearing from these same witnesses as well. What we're expecting today is two hours of a public hearing and then two hours of uh, where these House members will uh, be with these witnesses in a closed-door briefing. So, Rhonda, you know, we'll all be listening so closely to hear about Russia and Ukraine, but where can this wander? I mean, what are you going to be listening for in addition to those topics? Where else can, can members of this committee go? 
I think one of the number one things that we might hear in this hearing is concerns over cyber attacks. Uh, that's something that has been a part of the other reports from the last few years. Of course, it's concerning because uh, many experts, both uh, lawmakers as well as those in the Intelligence Committee, have wondered if uh, we will get hit with a cyber attack. Is that perhaps uh, the wave of uh, uh, next concern for Americans? So I suspect that uh, these witnesses, given that they are the heads of our intelligence community, will want to go over that. In past hearings, uh, they've also discussed how uh, foreign actors have tried to interfere in our elections. And, you know, we are in an election cycle, a very important one that will determine uh, the power structures here on the Hill. So I would suspect that cyber attacks uh, might be a significant part of this hearing. Also, you routinely hear some of the same countries mentioned in this report, uh, North Korea, Russia, China, Iran. I, I would suspect those countries will also be brought up and these lawmakers will be updated on some of those concerns uh, related to those regions. All right. Thanks so much, Rhonda. We'll keep checking in with you throughout this morning. Let's go now to Isabel Kershudian, who's in the Ukrainian port city of Odessa. And this is a city that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky had warned on Sunday that Russian forces were preparing to bomb. Isabel, it's so good to see you. Tell us about what the atmosphere is like in Odessa right now. How much fear and anticipation has been building up and, and also how much preparation? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I was just kind of out around the city myself. And today's International Women's Day, which is one of the bigger kind of holidays uh, on the calendar here. And I was surprised to see about, you know, how many people were out and kind of, you know, buying flowers for the women in their lives, things of that sort. But, you know, it, the city, it almost looks like, um, I would say, a scene out of World War II. There was these metal barricades everywhere, sandbags. Um, I saw one photo online that compared what the opera house looks like now with uh, the sandbags and these, you know, metal hedgehogs kind of all around it um, to a photo where it looked almost identical to World War II. Um, there is a lot of preparation. They know an attack is going to come here because of how important the city is to Ukraine economically. It's one of the largest Black Sea ports. And there are Russian warships off the coast. Every now and again, you'll hear kind of a booming thud in the distance. And what it is, is the air defense system here working. And that also is a sign that, you know, Russia is testing the air defenses here. Uh, right now, Russian troops are advancing on Mykolaiv, which is about 80 miles to the north, uh, to the northeast, rather. Um, I think the expectation here is that, you know, if Mykolaiv falls, then Russian troops will advance from the east and there will be an attempt to kind of attack from the sea itself. So you talked about some of the infrastructure preparations, I mean, seeing the sort of the, the portrait of the city change. But what are average civilians doing? Are people choosing to leave or sort of hunker down? Um, what choices do they have? Yeah, I think, you know, it's unique because unlike Kyiv and Kharkiv and other kind of major cities in Ukraine, there's been a lot of time to evacuate here. Um, you've had two weeks where, or nearly two weeks, where there hasn't uh, been a lot of, um, you know, shelling or anything like that here in Odessa. And the Moldovan and Romanian borders are very close to here. Uh, so if you wanted to evacuate, you had plenty of opportunity. Those borders, um, as far as crossing into them, are not as congested as the Polish border. Uh, however, a lot of people have chosen to stay. Um, there's a really large territorial defense and military presence around the city. You know, everywhere you go, you see people kind of carrying guns, um, you know, part of these various militias. And so, you know, people talk about being from Odessa as kind of a separate nationality. Yes, you're Ukrainian, but people from Odessa, people who live in Odessa have a special kind of love for this city. Uh, and so I think a lot of people have chosen to stay here. There's also a large elderly population here that isn't leaving, you know, not only because maybe they don't want to, but also because it's kind of impractical um, for a lot of them. You know, it's just hard to get on these trains and um, kind of be mobile enough uh, to evacuate. So there is a quite a bit of people still left in the city, and I think they are just kind of hunkering down and um, anticipating an attack to come, but using this time to prepare for it. Isabel, one of those people who's chosen to stay is your great aunt. Um, yeah, please tell us uh, more about your family connection to Odessa. 
Yeah, so I'm the first person in my family who was uh, born in the United States. Uh, both my parents and their parents were all born in Odessa. Um, they immigrated a long time ago in uh, 1978, but uh, my great aunt Zena, uh, my grandfather's older sister, uh, who was kind of a nanny for me when I was a kid, uh, she actually taught me how to speak Russian, uh, which is a pretty useful skill these days. Um, you know, she's here, she's staying. I asked her why she won't leave. Um, and she, you know, told me about how she went to the United States four different times. Her, you know, siblings all moved there, uh, but she came back every single time to Odessa that, you know, this city is really special to her. It's like home. There's a saying here, it's called Odessa Mama, which um, really kind of captures the feeling that the city is your mother and so your mother will take care of you. Mm. So this was your grandfather's sister, and she's been showing you around the city. Uh, and you were trying to go back and see where your grandparents had lived, but you weren't able to. Uh, talk to us about sort of just navigating the city with your great aunt and what you're able to do and not able to do. Yeah, it's weird. I never thought I would come here under these circumstances. Obviously, it's been quite difficult because just the fact that I'm here right now in the middle of a war uh, is kind of an indication that, you know, I'm expecting something to happen here, uh, which is devastating because, uh, you know, I have my own kind of personal love for this city. Um, and so to see it like this for the first time is quite strange. But yeah, it, a lot of streets are blockaded or closed. We tried to get to the street where, um, you know, my father grew up in as a baby and uh, we were stopped by, you know, territorial defense soldiers who were like, I'm sorry, you can't go through there. Um, you know, there's defensive operations going on. Um, you know, even today we had to get kind of a military escort to just get close to the opera house because it's so guarded um, and there's a lot of barricades around it. So really kind of all of the downtown streets that are usually really lively with cafes and um, civilian walkways and, you know, just has this like very um, European feel to it. Um, you know, those streets are closed or they're covered with soldiers or metal barricades and uh, it kind of looks unrecognizable. I mean, 7 p.m. curfew here. Uh, so it is, it's a very warlike atmosphere right now. Um, people are kind of getting used to it, but it is uh, a little strange, especially for, you know, the people who are used to kind of the nightlife, the clubs, um, and sort of a different feel to the city. Well, Isabel Kershidian, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for all your reporting. Uh, you can read Isabel's story about her personal connection to Odessa, as well as all of her comprehensive reporting uh, on our website. Thanks a lot, Isabel. We'll ho hopefully talk to you again soon. Thank you. Let's bring in James Homan. So, James, you know, this is day 13 of the Russian invasion. Can you talk to us about what's happening on the ground? And maybe while you're there at the map also, point out where Odessa is to us and, and why this has been seen as a really key city. Yeah, absolutely, Libby. Isabel was just talking to us from down here on Odessa, and she also mentioned Mykolaiv, uh, which is right now Russian-dominated. You can see there's a river dividing them. You. Ukraine has been weakest in its southern belly. Uh, part of that is because Russia has controlled Crimea since 2014, and the Donetsk and Luhansk regions over here have been under Russian control. So they were able to move in. There's a, a quite a large uh, Russian naval presence in the Black Sea. Isabel mentioned that the Russian subs and ships are testing the air defenses of Odessa. The Russians miscalculated here in the southern part of the country because they expected to be greeted as liberators and not as occupiers. And in a city like Mykolaiv, we've seen large protests, people waving Ukrainian flags, uh, sort of a, a revived Ukrainian patriotism and opposition uh, to Russian advances. So Odessa is one of the biggest prizes. And when you talk to people at the Pentagon before this war started two weeks ago, they thought that Putin would move into Odessa first, uh, that there's a, a very strategic port here. Uh, and, and this is a lot of the, uh, the most prosperous agriculture regions of the country are up here. Grain goes through the Odessa port and there's a, a major airport. Right now, the Ukrainians still control those. 
uh, the Odessa mayor was seen as someone who was allied with Russia, uh, but instead he has really embraced the cause of defending his city. So the, the Russians do control this area in pink here, including the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, uh, which is right here on the river, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. Uh, Russians now control that after shelling it last week. Ukrainians are still operating the plant, but they're literally doing so at gunpoint. The, the two biggest cities in the country, Libya, are to the north. Obviously, Kyiv up here is the biggest prize, and we'll talk in a few minutes about that. And Kharkiv continues to be shelled today. Uh, it's in the 4 o'clock hour now. And, uh, and, and this is the second biggest city in the country. There's about a million and a half people. Uh, and, and meanwhile, the West remains under Ukrainian control. So this, this area is where a lot of the fighting is taking place and up here as well. Yeah, you know, James, you pointed out that power plant. We can see the icons of other nuclear power plants uh, throughout Ukraine. Let's talk about their strategic importance as well as, you know, the, the, the importance that they're powering the country. Yeah, exactly. They're working power plants. And, uh, you know, millions of people, just for context, Ukraine is the size of Texas. You know, from here to the west is, is going from New York City to Chicago. There's about 40 million people who were living there before the invasion. And they really do depend on these nuclear power plants. And so Zaporizhia powers quite a lot of this region. A lot of these folks are without power. There has been some concern that the Russians could essentially use this to extort some of this area of the country that depends on power by threatening to shut off power or even, you know, blow up parts of the plant, there would be massive fallout over here. Ultimately, because Russians are confident that they're going to occupy and control the country, they have an incentive right now to protect these nuclear power plants uh, and to keep them online. Uh, but you can see that there's another major plant right here uh, that would potentially be part of any advance toward Odessa. These are strategic targets. Obviously, it's quite scary when anyone is shelling uh, a, a nuclear power plant. We, we really did get lucky uh, that there was not fallout uh, from the Zaporizhia plant. It's a different kind of power plant than up here, uh, which is the famous Chernobyl incident from 1986. Uh, that plant not online, uh, but the, obviously the fallout from Chernobyl affected all of Europe. There were clouds of radioactive dust above Oslo in Norway in the, in the 80s. And there are two plants here uh, in, in, in the western part of the country, in the more European aligned part of the country. And they really are providing lots of power for this half of the country. And uh, uh, Kyiv itself is, relies a little less on nuclear power than some other places because it's right on the Dnieper River, the major river that divides the country. And so there are dams along the Dnieper River that that provides most of the power for Kyiv. You know, James, let's talk about what else is happening this morning. You know, in addition to this hearing that we'll be broadcasting on worldwide threats, we also anticipate hearing from President Biden. And he'll announce that the United States is banning the imports of Russian oil. This is, of course, response to the invasion of Ukraine. And, and that's scheduled to be at about 1045. So, James, that move could trigger a spike in already high gas prices. Tell us more about the president's calculation and decision. Well, we'll see what it does to the markets. Uh, you know, the White House feels, a uh, senior administration official I talked to, that this is already sort of priced in. Pressure has been building for days uh, in a bipartisan way from Capitol Hill. And, and frankly, the United States itself does not import that much oil from Russia. Uh, most of it goes to uh, Hawaii, interestingly enough, because of its proximity in the Pacific uh, to uh, Russia, relatively speaking. Uh, yesterday, oil prices went as high as $139 a barrel, uh, and they fell back down to $120 a barrel by the end of trading. And that was because the German chancellor, Olaf Scholz, announced that Germany is, is very unlikely to ban Russian oil imports. That would push their country into a deep recession. They already canceled the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, but they're still getting quite a lot of energy through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. And so the, the markets came, the price of oil came back down because Germany canceling Russia imports would be a big deal. Right now, there are lots of oil tankers on the high seas with Russian oil uh, that are kind of not sure where they're going to go. There's a lot of thinking at the White House that ultimately China and India will end up buying this Russian oil. 
Uh, but so there, there's been a lot of behind the scenes maneuvering over the weekend. The United States has been trying really hard to uh, make sure that Europe will get the energy it needs, even if Russia chooses to cut off Europe. The, the uh, Biden White House sent a delegation down to meet with Venezuelan leaders on uh, Saturday to, to talk about potentially relaxing sanctions there. There are conversations with the Canadians, and most significantly, there are conversations with Saudi Arabia. If the Saudis increased production significantly, that would bring prices down. So far, the Saudis have resisted. And so, th basically, th this isn't terribly surprising. Uh, what's surprising is that it took Biden a couple days more to get to this position. White House folks say they've been working behind the scenes to make sure that this isn't going to cause disruptions, especially for Hawaii, which depends on Russian oil, making sure that there's going to be alternative sources to get there. Still, it's, a, it's, a, it's another significant move by the administration to show that the U.S. is taking this invasion seriously and is uh, retaliating accordingly. Thanks so much, James. Let's bring Rhonda Colvin back into this conversation. You know, you know Rhonda, so much of the direction of the questions that we're likely to hear from House Intel Committee members is sort of changing and evolving as the news is changing and evolving. So let's talk through what you'll be listening for in relation to Ukraine specifically and, and both intelligence, but also sort of feeling out some of the options that the Biden administration and Congress might have. Yeah, well, this uh, hearing will likely be sort of an information gathering uh, event for these lawmakers, both the public session and the closed door session that they will go into hours later. Uh, I will again be listening to what they have to say about cyber attacks. That's really something that is weighing on uh, the minds of many Americans, wondering if our financial institutions are safe, uh, wondering if uh, our food systems and uh, grocery stores are safe uh, from any sort of cyber attack. So I would assume that that is going to be brought up by some of these lawmakers on this committee. Many of these committee members also sit on committees that have uh, similar jurisdiction over issues of foreign affairs, uh, armed services, uh, and intelligence. So it's likely that they will be asking some informed questions, but they also will want to hear from these uh, members of our intelligence community. I will also be listening out about global health. That's been a part for the last few years, has been a part of this unclassified report from the intelligence Intelligence Committee uh, discussing COVID, uh, discussing how uh, we are protected from other pandemics or other strains that could be coming. So that also is a part of uh, what I'll be listening uh, to today as well. Great. Thanks, Rhonda. Karin Demergen joins us now. She covers Congress and national security for The Post. So, Karin, first, let, let's set up the basics here. You know, the, so much was baked into this hearing that happened before the last 13 days and this invasion of Ukraine. But but House members, of course, can go anywhere with their questions. And, and they're, you know, they're very aware of the news and they're grappling with questions about uh, how much these uh, these intel heads, these intelligence leaders can say publicly about Putin, about what's happening in Ukraine. So talk to us first about what you'll be listening for in terms of the Ukraine threads with the House Intel Committee. Well, look, I mean, they are going to probably not be giving the most juiciest bits in the open door session, right? Because I, it would be great if if we could listen for the, the details of exactly where things are on the ground, of what weapons we're planning to supply, if this deal with planes getting MiGs to the Ukrainians, um, which would give them more firepower with which to try to assert control over their airspace vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, um, then that would be very, very revelatory. But I'm very doubtful that we will hear those sorts of details. So I guess what I'm listening for the most to kind of un expand our understanding of where this is all going um, is just the, the spillover effects of all of this. Um, I, you know, the, the, we are suddenly handling what everybody is afraid of turning into World War III, and yet we have to juggle a lot of things at the same time. So there are questions, as Rhonda pointed out, questions about cyber attacks are one, right? Another question that I have is just about what does this do vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the, the, what we are seeing with just general global oil markets and what sort of stability that creates or instability that creates in other parts of the world. Does, what is China thinking watching this, and does that change China's approach to certain other parts of the, its sphere of influence. There's always a question about what is China going to do with Taiwan? Well, our reaction to what Russia does in Ukraine could send certain signals to other, other major powers that also have problematic behavior towards their less strong neighbors. Um, I'm also wondering if anybody's going to ask questions about, you know, food security and what sort of spillover and in, in terms of traditional national security concerns that could cause, because you're talking about Ukraine and Russia together, which are a little distracted right now, um, 
25% of the world's wheat supply, over half of the world's sunflower oil, various things that are kind of staples that get exported to around the world that is now going to send the, the price of food, not just in this country up, but in places in the world that are really dependent on there being enough of a supply in the global economy to meet the demands of places that are not able to produce their own. So uh, all of these um, questions are things I'm listening for. Um, I'm listening to see if there's going to be any discussion of, you know, countries that have been dependent on Russia or accommodating of Russia, potentially changing their calculus right now. That could be fairly pivotal in, in areas like Central Asia, where we've been trying to get a better foothold because of our ha our departure from Afghanistan. So it's it's a web. Everything is interconnected. And though I don't I don't assume that we're going to get radically new details on Ukraine specifically, you know, the territory of Ukraine right now and what's going on there in the open session, it depends on what questions people ask. We could get some interesting takes on how this is all potentially radiating and may continue to radiate even after if the fighting dies down, I guess, in Ukraine. Karen, what opportunity does a public hearing offer, uh, both for House members, but also for these heads of intelligence agencies? Because they have the opportunity now not just to talk to the American public, but also to talk to the global community and do it in this public setting as opposed to behind those closed doors. When everyone is listening, could they use this opportunity to send some signals? Yeah, I mean, they they certainly could. It, it, it's a rare opportunity in which the intelligence chiefs are actually not really communicating directly with members of Congress, because they do that all the time, but communicating directly with the American public, which is a very rare occasion. And so you've seen, you know, in the past, uh, when the intelligence community wants to make a statement of its assertions as as compared to the diplomatic community, the president, et cetera, these hearings can become a real moment for that. We saw that especially during the Trump administration when there was this question of, you know, Russian interference, not Russian interference in the election. You don't have those sorts of tensions right now between the intelligence community and the White House the way that you used to. Um, but, you know, there's some people that are going to be on this dais that have some fairly unique experience. I mean, the CIA director used to be ambassador to Russia, right? And so you, you've got insights here that are not just um, that, that are not just limited to kind of reading the signals right now, which is, of course, very important, but actually could be able to provide some contextualization to that, too, which would be important for the public's understanding of this, um, because that has been a constant challenge for all parts of the administration to communicate to the country why it is that they need to be caring about this and how it's maybe not just about this country in Ukraine, which has gained gained quite the stature in the United States over the last several years due to various fits and starts of crises surrounding Ukraine. Um, but that it, it, it's not just about this one particular territory on Europe's eastern flank, that it, that it is, is potentially um, relevant in other ways um, and, and, and what people should expect for, for, for that going forward. So it's, it's a different set of voices and voices that are really, really steeped in, in these matters to be projecting this message, which I think will expand upon what the administration has been saying, not really be in conflict with it. Uh, James Homan, you know, let's talk about this web that Karin's laying out for us, uh, these interwoven global threats and challenges as these intel chiefs see them. Uh, how significant is it that this is an opportunity to, to make some of those global connections? Yeah, Libby, it's, it's amazing the spillovers that you sometimes don't anticipate, the unintended consequences of this decision by Putin. Uh, you know, it, it feels so far away, but there's all these little things. Obviously, Karun talked about the potential supply shocks. Uh, even a company like Boeing, it turns out, gets its titanium from a Russian company that's controlled by a Russian oligarch, and that is going to have an impact on the economy in the Seattle area. Uh, the, the Sri Lankan economy, uh, is it, its biggest source of tourists is Russia, and Russians can no longer go visit Sri Lanka, so the Sri Lanka economy is likely to enter a depression. What kind of political impact is that going to have on that country? Uh, th that is probably too in the weeds for this two-hour hearing, uh, but it, it's a, a, a kind of a vignette of how a lot of these, these problems can have multiplier effects. Higher gas prices uh, may cause people to travel less, which could affect hotels here in the United States and result in hospitality workers who've just gotten hired again after the pandemic is sort of coming to an end, uh, causing them to lose their jobs again. So we are very much part of an interconnected world. And, uh, and, and it, this is all happening against the backdrop of the biggest humanitarian crisis 
since World War II in Europe. Already the, the numbers that we're seeing uh, of refugees, for example, are higher than the number of Syrians we saw back in 2015. And you'll recall what a political crisis that was on the European continent. It frankly led to, uh, or s helped spur Brexit and helped spur the rise of a lot of far-right nationalists. And here, uh, we, we're having a hard time keeping up, Libby. Uh, the, the, the numbers are so large. Ukraine, again, a country of 40 million people. We made this graphic earlier this morning and it shows more than 1.8 million refugees from Ukraine. The United Nations in the last 10 minutes has just said the number is now over 2 million. More than half the refugees are going to Poland. A million people have entered Poland in the last two weeks from Ukraine. These are people who are often coming with just the clothes on their back and maybe a backpack. Uh, there are massive backlogs. Uh, the roads are backed up with people trying to cross over. The uh, images of trains full to the gills, thousands of people waiting in train stations, all hoping to go west. So most are going to Poland. Uh, you know, More than 100,000 have gone to Slovakia and Hungary, Romania, uh, Moldova. Uh, as we heard from Isabel a few minutes ago, people aren't really evacuating from Odessa when they do, which is likely when there's a, a Russian attack from the east or an amphibious landing, you'll see the numbers go up pretty dramatically. And in fact, the UN is saying this morning, Libby, that they expect in the next 10 days, the number of refugees from Ukraine will pass 4 million. Just dramatic numbers. And it's going to be hard. Countries are being very welcoming right now. It's, it's, it's hard to, to kind of bring 4 million people into Europe. Uh, and how many refugees will the United States take is an open question. So these are the kinds of things that could then have massive effects on Poland and its politics and its economy uh, and in, in ways that we can't even really begin to imagine, third, fourth order effects. And that's where the U.S. intelligence community is pretty good at trying to think through and grapple with if this, then that. Um, Karin, let's talk about the humanitarian corridors. You know, as we look at that map that James just laid out for us of, of where refugees are going and just the massive amounts of numbers, uh, there is a real concern, Karin, about Russia allowing people to escape some of the cities under siege. What is your latest reporting on that? Yeah, well, we've been hearing from Pentagon sources that, you know, civilians are being hit as they're trying to flee. Now, they're not going so far as to saying civilians are being targeted as they are trying to flee, but they are being hit. And, you know, we've seen images of, of the of the result of that, too. And so this is, look, I mean, the, the, the ceasefire has not been that durable, as it appears um, on the ground. Clearly, the fighting has continued in very many areas of the country. Um, and this idea of a humanitarian corridor is... Nice, but if, if if it's not actually being realized, then that just says that the stakes of where people, the, the stakes that people are facing as they make the decision of whether or not to flee, is still just as high as it ever was. And I look, I, the, the the numbers are staggering of the refugee count and the spillover effects in Europe. Remember, wherever you see a refugee count, you usually have as equal or greater numbers of people who are already internally displaced within the country, which means they, maybe that's not a problem for Europe yet because they're still in Ukraine. But if you've left your home, you've left your community, you are on the road, you are trying to make it to a border, you're not exactly in a stable situation either in the meantime. And that, this is just like global truth that it's an undercount usually of the people that are displaced from their, their homes and within the country until they cross that border and are counted by a UN agency. Um, so that's, that's significant as well. You know, you've been covering these talks between Russia and, and Ukrainian officials. Uh, what can you tell us about how they've been going? Well, we've seen them go for several rounds at this point, which means they're still going. But the question really is, are, are these demands coming anywhere within the realm of something that they could meet? You know, I mean, it, it does not appear that Russia yet is willing to kind of accept um, an armed Ukraine, a Ukraine that wants to be looking westward, all the things that Ukraine has kind of staked its whole identity on over the last decade. Um, and Ukraine is not interested in effectively becoming a vassal state or watching itself get carved up, um, which, you know, in Russia diplomatically already has because they recognized the two um, separatist controls, Eastern republics as separate states. So there is a real impasse here. 
And, you know, as long as the bombardment continues, and, and, and remember, we're actually seeing as, as much as the diplomatic talks are ongoing, we're seeing intensified bombardments of these population centers. Yes, the, the Ukrainians have managed to hold back things like the convoy, hold back these Russian supply lines <clears throat> and advances on the ground. But the Russians have moved from using a majority of short range missiles to long range missiles to try to hit the cities from further away. And, and that means that they are, you know, that they are continuing the pressure and, and, and upping the pressure, frankly, on all of these major areas, um, mm -hmm. even as we're seeing these diplomatic talks going. Now, now, that can sometimes be a tactic to try to squeeze your opponent to making concessions they would not otherwise make. But I have not yet seen the Ukrainians say, OK, fine, you know, too many people have died. We're willing to fold our cards here. That's not the spirit that they're projecting. A and Putin has not been projecting the idea of, you know, we, we were saying all along that if he got into this fight, it was going to be really difficult for him to get out of the fight because he needs a win. And there's not an obvious win here. And, and the sanctions keep coming and the economic measures mm -hmm. keep coming. And yes, you can scale those back once you've put them out. We can always say, all right, fine, we'll start buying Russian oil again or we'll lift your central bank sanctions. But we can't say that unless we see a real, real first concession from, from Putin. And, and he's not been in that sort of a mood. So it's good that the talks are ongoing, but I don't know that I can actually tell you that I've seen progress that leads us to be hopeful that this isn't going to be, you know, grinding in for a long haul. Karin Demergen, thank you so much. Really appreciate all of your insights. We can see there an image of where the Intel Committee will be meeting soon. That's inside the Rayburn House Office Building. And we will be seeing testimony from the top Intel chiefs in this country. I want to bring Rhonda Colvin in uh, to talk about what Congress can do right now, Rhonda, you know, as we hear uh, reporting that President Biden will be speaking later, talking about banning Russian oil imports, uh, as we hear Karin catalog and go through uh, what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, what can Congress do? Well, there hasn't been a, a lot of big legislation uh, related to Ukraine just yet, but I think by the end of this week that could be different. Uh, I know there has been a lot of talk and loud calls for this ban on Russian oil imports, and that's something that the Speaker of the House over the weekend told uh, Democratic lawmakers in the House that she wanted to put legislation related to that on the floor up for a vote. And then yesterday there was a lot of discussion between both chambers, the House and the Senate, about a legislative package that would ban Russian oil imports. It also goes further where it gives the executive branch more power to uh, enhance tariffs, tariffs and uh, on Russia, and it will also block uh, Russia from joining the World Trade Organization. So it does go a step further. Uh, we're, of course, waiting for uh, the Biden administration to tell us what their plans are on that ban, but there is legislation that would uh, cover different elements of the situation. There is also uh, an, an aid package in the works. That's something that we spoke to Senator Chris Coons in, uh, uh, from Delaware in the Senate yes, last week, and he told us that he was confident that something would come about around $10 billion. And it looks like now that it could be $12 billion. The White House asked for about $10 billion. Now senators think that they can get even more money. That would include money for weapons, assistance for uh, Ukraine, as well as uh, some of the other countries in that region. It would also give some support to the Treasury Department to enforce these sanctions. So there's a lot of uh, momentum, I would say, on Capitol Hill, and it's moving pretty fast. And it is also bipartisan and uh, bicameral, where you have both chambers discussing what they want to do for Ukraine. So uh, it looks like by the end of this week, uh, we will see some sort of movement uh, on both of those issues. All right, Rhonda, thank you. Well, as violence in Ukraine continues to escalate, the human toll mounts as well. On Saturday, a suspected Russian rocket hit a residential area in Bila Circa, a town 50 miles south of Kyiv. 15-year-old Anna was at home when the blast hit, and our colleague Washington Post video journalist John Gerberg met her and has this story. Коли це сталося, я була у ліжку, я тільки прокинулась і я бачила дуже білий світ скрізь. Я чула, як падають обламки і відразу почала кричати своїм близьким, чи з ними все добре. З одної сторони це все жахливо, але я рада, що всі живі і всі з усіма все добре. Також тут ще живе мій кіт, якого ще досі не вдалося знайти, блін. Я 
отримали декілька поранень, але вони не дуже сильні. Це просто подряпане від осколок і якийсь шоковий стан, але я думаю, все буде добре і це все можна відбудувати. Нема ніякого, я не знаю, нічого немає. Тут просто це жилі дома, це біля річки, тут гуляють люди, це таке більш красиве місце, ніж якесь воєнне. Наша, наші військові дуже добре працюють, вони справді дуже стараються і е, допомагають всім, чим можуть. І це дуже важливо, це підтримка нашої країни. Для інших людей, для інших країн, які думають, що які говорять неправду, на нас дійсно нападають і не на просто воєнні об'єкти, а на звичайних людей. Це жахливо і я навіть не знаю, як можна вірити чомусь іншому. A piece filed by our colleague John Gerberg profiling a 15-year-old Anna in Ukraine. Let's bring John Hudson into the conversation, national security reporter focusing on the State Department and diplomacy. You know, John, this war is unfolding with real-time images, real-time stories, thanks to our colleagues who are reporting from there, as well as because of social media. How influential is the connection that people all over the world are feeling with Ukrainians, including the Ukrainian president right now, as he shares his own story uh, in interviews and over social media? How much is that changing uh, how top diplomats are responding to Ukraine? I think it's having a massive impact, uh, you, you know, thanks to our reporters on the ground, John Gerberg and so many others who are doing such a great job at making those images and seeing and tracking the toll of the humanitarian devastation going on. It's being beamed into people's homes uh, everywhere and into their phones and onto their television sets. And it really has created a lot of public outcry about what more the West can do to help Ukrainian people as their cities are demolished and their homes are destroyed and their family members are killed. Uh, right now, I, I think as a result, you know, just look at this morning, the administration's move to ban uh, Russian gas and oil imports. That is something that the administration initially said it was going to rule out. It said it's not going to, it's going to look very closely at protecting Americans at the gas pump. That was a priority. But because some of these images like we just saw have been, have been coming out, it's really created a rallying call. Um, by populations uh, in the United States, also in Europe, uh, to do more. And this is the next step, uh, really willing to you see government officials doing more uh, to punish Russia than they had ever promised, uh, even if it's going to hurt um, uh, you know, Americans at the gas pump and potentially hurt the administration politically, given how important gas prices are in terms of shaping moods ahead of um, the midterm election. What can you tell us about Secretary of State Antony Blinken's diplomatic efforts over the past few days? Catch us up on the latest. Yeah, so the secretary has been making a, um, a trip, uh, you know, of many countries uh, in a short amount of time uh, in, in Eastern Europe, trying to shore up allies. Uh, you know, the trip started in Brussels, but now he's made his way over to the Baltic states. Uh, and he was also in, uh, on, the, on the Polish border and even stepped into Ukraine. Um, you know, this is more of what he has been up to for the last several months, which is getting on the same page uh, with allies, uh, pushing for support. Um, he's been really, uh, he, he, there have been a big push on getting him to nail down specifics about how the U.S. and other Western allies are going to support the Ukrainians right now, with a big focus being put on airplanes uh, and fighter jets. Uh, the you know Russians very quickly vanquished uh, much of Ukraine's military assets and air bases and planes. And right now, you've seen the you know willingness initially from Europeans to provide fighter jets, and now it looks like that effort is, is dwindling. Um, the, the secretary has spoken the last 24 hours, saying the U.S. is trying to do you know what it can to backfill 
um, you know, any country that might be willing to give planes, you know, re, the U.S. would resupply them. Uh, but the administration has also said that, you know, this is uh, a risky endeavor if you have planes from NATO countries entering Ukraine and then shooting down Russian fighter jets. That brings them uncomfortably close to being co-belligerents, uh, you know, in more layman's terms, co-combatants in a war that they said that they would not be specifically a part of. Mm. I want to talk more about that potential for any kind of no-fly zone in a moment. But first, uh, let's go back to Rhonda Colvin. Rhonda, in about an hour's time, we are anticipating hearing from President Biden talking about this uh, Russian oil ban. And in about 15 minutes' time, we'll see the House Intel Committee get down to business with the top intelligence chiefs. Tell us what we should be listening for in today's hearing for people who are just joining us. Yeah, for those who are just joining us, this hearing is something that happens annually. You will have all the heads of the U.S. intelligence community testifying in front of this House intelligence panel. Uh, they will be discussing what they deem are the top worldwide threats right now. So that could be anything between uh, cyber attacks, that could mean global health, that could mean uh, weapons proliferation across the, the world. So many uh, details are usually discussed in this hearing. So we expect that uh, the first first set of this hearing will take about two hours. That'll be a public phase uh, where we'll be able to watch, members of the public will be able to watch, and then these committee members will go in a closed-door session for the next two hours of the day. This is also going to happen on the Senate side on Thursday, where these same witnesses will testify in front of the Senate intelligence uh, hearing. So this uh, hearing will be led by the chairman, Adam Schiff. Uh, the ranking member, top Republican, is Mike Turner of uh, Ohio. This is uh, one of the first times people People may have seen him. He has just been named to ranking uh, member of this hearing after Devin Nunes left uh, to work with Trump on his uh, social media company. So uh, this uh, committee is set with 13 uh, House Democrats, nine Republicans, and uh, you can expect a, a lot of uh, information from these intelligence uh, heads. They are, are going to go over so many different things uh, that are concerning them, and you might get a forecast of where uh, their eyes are watching right now when it comes to worldwide threats. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Uh, John, let's go back to you to talk more about this idea of a no-fly zone in Ukraine. We are hearing uh, from more voices on Capitol Hill now calling for some sort of a no-fly zone, maybe over the humanitarian corridors, which, of course, have not. Russia has not really followed through on their claims of allowing humanitarian corridors. Um, so where is that conversation at? And, you know, you were talking about some of the risks that the United States sees if they were to enact some sort of no-fly zone with NATO. Yeah, I think really uh, there has been uh, this, these proposals about a no-fly zone have really started to hit reality where, uh, you know, the, in theory, it sounds very nice. Um, you have these, uh, you know, Russian jets that are really laying uh, in, in really in, in a siege mode uh, over parts of Ukraine. And wouldn't it be great if they, you know, were no longer flying over Ukraine and dropping bombs? Uh, but the, the reality is uh, a no-fly zone is basically a, a declaration of war against Russia. You would have uh, U.S. planes uh, patrolling the skies and um, you shooting down Russian jets. And I think so, you know, things have sort of turned a tide. And even some of the most hawkish members of uh, the Republican Party in Congress, uh, Marco Rubio would be one, um, ha has said that that is even a step too far for him. And, and he has proposed a variety of, of very tough measure measures against Russia. So when you have um, leading Republicans like that, even even pumping the brakes on that, I think it does show that um, that, that, that type of measure is not going to uh, really be uh, approved by the White House anytime soon. All right. Thanks, John. Let's go back to James Homan. You know, James, uh, the Ukrainian president, is really begging the world to do something and, and, and deal with the Russians, enact some sort of no-fly zone. Uh, a lot of the question is the protection of Kyiv. Right. And the capital of this country, where the president, in fact, still is. Um, talk to us about what's happening now in the capital. Yeah, Libby, you're absolutely right. Kiev is the capital of nearly four million people and the biggest prize for the Russians. Originally, U.S. intelligence thought it would fall within a couple of days. But the Ukrainian air defenses have proved stronger than expected. There is a lot of fighting around Kyiv. This uh, is a very good map because the pink sort of shows where Russian forces are. 
The concern is that they're trying to get all around Kyiv to essentially sack the city to bomb them into submission. But the Ukrainians are fighting back. The thing to understand about urban warfare is that the person on the defensive has the advantage. Uh, the, there's no element of surprise here. Today, there have been extensive reports of fighting between Ukrainian territorial defense forces and Russians in this eastern suburb of Permoha. Uh, there have also been a lot of clashes in uh, the, the, the suburb of Irbin over here, the western suburbs. The Russians are setting up a forward operating helicopter base here in Evenkiv. I'm sure viewers have, have heard about this Russian convoy over the last couple of days. Here is the convoy. Uh, it has basically been stalled. It's 40 miles long. It's about 20 miles outside of Kyiv proper. The Ukrainians have kept it in place. They've bombed uh, some of the tanks at the front of the convoy, meaning the rest can't get through. So there is a massive amount of uh, Russian equipment, a lot of which has run out of gas now that it's been sitting there uh, because Russian soldiers are concerned about being killed in their uh, vehicles, they're camping in the woods. Uh, and, anyway, this convoy is lined up preparing to take Kyiv. Uh, they also have a lot of forces who have come in. Uh, they came in through the Chernobyl uh, zone, which is not populated since the nuclear fallout there from Belarus. The Russians still do not control Chernayev. Uh, there have been a, a lot of reports today of Russian shelling of Chernayev, and the, the Ukrainian fear, as it relates to the protection of Kyiv, is that the Russians will get control of Chernayev, and then they'll be able to come down really what's basically an interstate, this main road, and they'll be able to attack Kyiv from east and west. Uh, there is a, a major dam about 60 miles south of Kyiv uh, the, the Ukrainians, there's some thought, uh, could they, they currently control. There could be clashes down here. So it's a, it's a tenuous position for Kyiv, but as you note, Volodymyr Zelensky is still there. The Ukrainian parliament is just on the west side of the Dnieper River, uh, but, but tough fighting is expected in the days ahead. Does control of Ukraine hinge on control of Kyiv, James? Not necessarily. Uh, there, you, the, the Pentagon and the CIA don't like to talk about it, uh, but there is a scenario where you could have uh, a kind of a government in exile operating either from Poland uh, just to the west or from the western part of Ukraine. Uh, if Kyiv falls, obviously it's a, it's a huge blow. Uh, it really is the capital in, in every respect, uh, not just politically, but culturally, economically. But you really could see a scenario where Zelensky continues to govern the, the western part of the country that's more aligned with Europe and Putin controls the east. All right. Thank you so much, James Homan. Uh, John Hudson, you know, the time that has been given uh, by the Ukrainians fighting back and resisting has allowed for Secretary of State Blinken and other diplomats around the world to sort of marshal their forces, organize and, and figure things out. How crucial has that been to the global reaction? Yeah, no, I, I mean, people had estimated that this was going to be a conflict that would be over very quickly, that Kyiv would fall. And that has really created a, a more space for um, but really uh, a lot of questions about where U.S. policy will pivot next. And to be honest, there are a lot of questions about if the administration has a game plan for what comes next. They have done a remarkable job in terms of uniting the West and imposing crippling, punishing, and devastating sanctions on Russia. But the real question is, how are they going to stop the fighting? And what we haven't seen is the United States particularly involved in advancing proposals for ceasefires, advance, getting involved in the humanitarian corridors. Uh, it's unclear if the United States has clearly conveyed to Russia a diplomatic off-ramp. Uh, things have not looked good for the Russians uh, in terms of their the timing of, their, of the conflict. The war is behind. They're facing stiff resistance. Uh, the, you know, but, but most importantly of all, it would be better for all parties involved if this conflict uh, ended, at least from the perspective of 
you know, saving Ukrainian lives at this at this juncture. And I do think that the United States is very much focused on imposing costs for Russia, creating pain for the Russians. Uh, but what we haven't seen is a lot of even uh, closed door meetings or discrete communications with the Russians to provide an off ramp. I think there is skepticism uh, on the U.S. side. Uh, that the Russians uh, would be willing to to stop, but you know, in a situation like this, where you have a death toll climbing and a death toll that could climb at, at a much more rapid clip, depending on how severe hostilities are, it only raises the importance of really exhausting all diplomatic options. And right now, most of the diplomacy is going on between Ukrainians and Russians themselves on the Belarusian war- border and French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, who, and, uh, uh, who has made phone calls and uh, is talking to all the leaders involved. Uh, and, and I should also add the uh, Israeli prime minister uh, as well. Um, it's, it's, you know, at, at this point and at this juncture, those haven't resulted in breakthroughs. The real question is when is the most powerful country um, that is surrounding this conflict, the United States, uh, going to get involved in a big way on the diplomatic front rather than just the punitive economic front. All right, John Hudson, thank you so much. Let's go to Paul Sony, who covers national security for The Washington Post and is a Russia specialist. Paul, you know, so much of this question of diplomacy comes down to one man, Russian President Vladimir Putin. So can you give us some insight into his mindset? What do we know? I think we're at a point where it's extremely hard for Vladimir Putin to back down. You know, when he announced this invasion, he went out there and he stated some pretty maximalist goals, right? He said, I want to denazify Ukraine, the Ukrainian government. I want to demilitarize the country, um, essentially saying that he was launching this military action in order to undertake regime change. When he says denazify the government, what he really means is I want a new government um, in Ukraine that is more friendly to the Kremlin. So, you know, now that he has stated that, anything that he achieves short of that um, is going to be viewed as a failure, right? It's going to be viewed as a failure, um, prim- most importantly, by his inner circle, by the security chiefs around him, um, by the military. And so it's going to be very hard for him to climb down um, if he decides that if he decides that this war is becoming too costly. Uh, so unfortunately, what I think we're likely to see, um, especially now that Russia is suffering increasing economic costs at home, is a doubling down um, by Putin. And now, <clears throat> now that their first, the Russian military's first plan uh, to storm Ukrainian cities, thinking there wouldn't be resistance, hasn't hasn't played out. I think you can see them already shifting course um, to this sort of dirty playbook that the Russian military has had before, where they surround cities, um, they besiege civilians in those cities, they cut off civilian infrastructure, um, and they try to essentially uh, starve out, um, you know, push out whatever government or um, fighters remain in the city um, before going in. And, and trying to take it block by block. Um, you know, this is a really risky um, thing for Putin. You know, I've been following him. He's been in the Kremlin for almost 22 years. Um, this is by far the riskiest undertaking he has ever endeavored. Um, and I think it, it has turned out that he had some pretty flawed assumptions um, about uh, whether or not the Ukrainian government would flee, how much of a fight the Ukrainians would put up, how well the Ukrainian military would do. Um, but I would also caution folks that we aren't seeing the full might of the Russian military yet. Um, the Russian Navy has really not been very involved. The Russian Air Force uh, hasn't really been very involved. Um, and so I think I think as, as, as the Russian military regroups, realizes that they need a new strategy, um, we're likely to see increased fighting and probably more power uh, coming in from the Russian side. Paul, we're just a few minutes away from this House Intelligence Committee hearing where we will hear from the top uh, intelligence leaders. Uh, let's talk about what you'll be listening for, and in particular, CIA Director Bill Burns, who you know was just sent to Moscow a few months ago uh, to talk to the Kremlin. Uh, what will you be listening for in this open session? 
Well, Bill, and Bill Burns also used to be the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, um, and so he uh, has a particular insight here. I think people will be all very eager to hear how he assesses the situation in Ukraine and also how he assesses the situation in Russia. Um, as John pointed out, I think we're in this situation where the Biden administration lined up all of these um, quite severe sanctions as a threat to try to prevent Putin from uh, invading Ukraine. He went ahead and did it anyway. Um, and as a result, uh, both Europe and the U.S. have put all of these extremely heavy economic penalties on Russia. Um, but the question is, what happens now? Um, I think what you see a little bit is um, you know, the U.S. and European capitals are saying, we're putting these sanctions on Russia in order to try to get Russia to pull back, to stop this war in Ukraine. But the way it's being read in Moscow is, finally, Finally, the masks are off, um, and the Europeans and the Americans are admitting what we suspected all along, which is that they want to change. They want to kick Putin out of office. They want to change the regime in Russia. That is their actual goal. Um, and you know, the reason for these harsh economic measures on the central bank, um, for all of these companies pulling out, it's all a coordinated campaign uh, by Washington and its allies in Europe to put pressure on us to force Putin out of office. Now, the White House um, has said that's not the case. Um, European leaders have said that that is not the case, um, that they really are doing this to try to change Putin's behavior, not to try to change the government in Russia. But, you know, you also see people like Boris Johnson, his spokesman, came out and essentially said, yeah, you know, part of the reason we're doing this is because we would like to see a different government in Russia. So I think, as, as John pointed out, we are in a very difficult stage here. Uh, everything was kind of lined up very well by the Biden administration. They did a lot of diplomacy in the lead up to this. Invasion. Um, but now we're in this in this period where um, the fighting is still going on. Uh, people want to see some solution to this. People want to see civilians make sure civilians aren't targeted, not see these huge migration flows, not see so many people die. Um, and I think the U.S. and Europe are trying, going to have to regroup and figure out what is their approach going forward, other than more and more escalatory punitive measures against Russia. Oh, thank you, Paul. You know, James, uh, this hearing is about worldwide threats. And as we hear Paul talk about uh, the danger to Ukrainians and the danger on the ground in Europe, uh, we will be listening to see how these intelligence chiefs talk to members of the House openly, also members of the American public, about what happens in Europe and how it has uh, repercussions here in the United States in terms of threats. What is the opportunity for them today to send a message to Americans? Well, there's a real chance to show bipartisan resolve and support for Ukraine. The leaders of the Republican and Democratic caucuses pick the members of the Intelligence Committee. So this is a more serious committee than uh, some of the others, and uh, the questions will be more highbrow. Uh, and there is really a chance to see, you know, there's uh, members of Congress who represent some of the biggest populations of Ukrainian Americans in the country, including Mike Turner from Ohio, the ranking Republican member who replaced Devin Nunes, but also Mike Quigley from Illinois, from Chicago, big Ukrainian community there. So I think that the world will be watching to see what the intelligence leaders are saying, but it will also go a long way to show uh, that, that Congress actually is uh, pretty united on, on the, the broad contours of the Russian response. James, what will you be listening for this morning? The, those interconnections that we talked about a few minutes ago, Libby, what, what is this going to do for China? What is China taking away from uh, the West's response as it relates to, to Taiwan? Uh, what does this mean uh, for the future of Europe? Is this going to make it harder for the U.S. to pivot from Europe to Asia? Uh, what are Putin's long-term ambitions? There, there really are a, a, a host of ways that this connects uh, to to every other challenge in the globe, even the Iran nuclear talks that are ongoing. Russia is a party to those talks. And it, it is, is the current conflict going to make it harder to stop Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons? Mm. Uh, Paul Sony, as we watch these intelligence chiefs go before this committee, uh, what is the role of these intelligence agencies in responding to the crisis in Ukraine? You know, one of the things I think one of the big takeaways of this entire crisis is that it has been a great rehabilitation in the public eye of U.S. intelligence, uh, particularly after the WMD debacle um, heading into Iraq. Uh, really made a lot of people doubt uh, the capabilities of U.S. intelligence. What we've seen here from day one is U.S. intelligence 
um, being declassified and the Biden administration essentially warning what's going to happen next at every step of the way um, as Russia undertook this invasion. Um, and that can't be comfortable for people in Moscow, uh, because it means that the U.S. actually has quite a good handle on what the kinds of decisions the Russian military are making. Um, as you know, Biden came out and, and people sort of doubted him when he said, look, uh, what we're seeing here is the possibility of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, including the sacking of Kiev. Um, that's exactly what has happened. Um, they also came out and said, we believe, you know, a couple days before, we know that Vladimir Putin has made his decision and given orders to go ahead. Lo and behold, a few days later, um, tanks start rolling into Ukraine. And, you know, the, 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 they've also warned about um, attempts to install a puppet government, um, which could be the next stage of this after uh, Russian forces uh, take some of these cities, though I think that is going to take uh, quite a while here. So, um, you know, U.S. intelligence, I think, has certainly um, sort of rehabilitated its reputation um, in, in this crisis. Um, but what people, I think, will be looking for today is also, what are the other threats that uh, Vladimir Putin poses to Europe and to the world order? Um, you know, I think one of the big takeaways for Ukraine um, you know, in, in the Ukraine crisis has been that this might not stop here. And there's certainly a risk as um, Western powers, Poland, the Baltics, um, you know, go ahead. Adam Schiff, as we head to the Intelligence Committee and hear from the top intelligence chiefs in the country. Thank you all uh, for joining us today. Uh, without objection, the chair may declare a recess at any time. Uh, before we begin, I want to address uh, some housekeeping matters. First, today's open portion is being broadcast live and streamed on the committee's website. It will be conducted entirely on an unclassified basis. All participants are reminded to refrain from discussing classified or other information protected from public disclosure. We will reconvene for the classified portion of the hearing this afternoon. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. We are holding this worldwide threats hearing amid an international crisis. As we sit here today, Russia is continuing an unprovoked war against Ukraine that has resulted in thousands of casualties, millions of refugees, and a conflict that seems to be only escalating in severity. In the past two weeks, the administration has led a massive international campaign to ensure Putin and his oligarchs feel the cost of this horrific, brutal war. As Democrats and Republicans, as Americans, we stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine in their heroic struggle. As we work to help Ukraine defend itself and to make Russia face the consequences of its aggression, we are in a stronger position today because of the extraordinary work of the intelligence community. The IC has provided exceptional insight into the potential of a Russian invasion over the past several months. The IC has helped expose Putin's playbook for policymakers, our allies, our partners in Ukraine, and the rest of the world. And to a degree unprecedented in my time in, on this committee, we have also made public highly sensitive intelligence to disrupt Russia's planning and malign activities. Our ability to prepare the Ukrainian government to defend itself and to rally the international community around imposing unprecedented economic consequences on Russia and the military assistance to Ukraine would not have been possible without the IC's work. This hearing is an opportunity for you all to highlight the threats we face in a more complex and dangerous world. We're witnessing the largest military conflict in Europe since World War II. The administration has made it clear we are not placing U.S. military forces into the conflict in Ukraine. As a result, we'll have to rely on other capabilities and increase our cooperation with our NATO allies. We also face numerous other strategic challenges from the rise of an increasingly bellicose and belligerent China to the threats posed by Iran and North Korea. Among the challenges from these nation states, as well as from non-state actors, is the use of cyber operations that continue to target both the U.S. government as well as the private sector. Offensive cyber operations present a significant risk to our homeland, and as the crisis in Ukraine continues, we must be extremely watchful. While some of these risks, such as climate change or pandemic disease, are framed uh, as often as soft threats, the reality is they are anything but. 
The nearly one million Americans who have died from COVID-19 demonstrate that. Furthermore, climate change is becoming the most urgent matter that the United States and the rest of the world must address. In October of last year, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a report on climate change in which they assessed that climate change will increasingly exacerbate risks to U.S. national security interests as the physical impacts increase and geopolitical tensions mount about how to respond to the challenge. That's putting it mildly. In the midst of all these threats, there is a global struggle between democracy and autocracy. Authoritarian governments are emboldened using force and technology to enforce their will while ignoring human rights and fundamental freedoms and spreading dangerous misinformation. To meet any of the threats before us today effectively, the United States must remain committed to our values and to the promotion of democracy and fundamental human rights. Uh, thank you again, uh, all of you, for your service and for appearing here today. I will now yield to the ranking member for any opening remarks that he'd like to make. Well, good morning. Thank you all for being here and for your leadership on very incredibly important issues for our national security, including leading uh, in our intelligence community. Usually when we have our worldwide threats hearing, most of what we discuss is theoretical. How can we be prepared for threats that are emerging? How we can, can we ascertain uh, threats that may be imminent? Uh, today, uh, this hearing is much different because war has once again uh, begun in Europe. President Zelensky has called on our country to provide weapons so that he can defend his nation and his people. Uh, the administration was late uh, to provide those weapons and is just now trying to get weapons in, President Zelensky openly stating that if those weapons had been there earlier, they could have made a difference. He is now calling for MiGs so that he can um, compete in the skies. And the, once again, the administration is slow to respond to that request. Vladimir Putin casts a long shadow over this hearing. This is an unprovoked war against a validly elected country. <clears throat> now, uh, President Zelensky has called for a no-fly zone over Ukraine um, to stop the killing of innocent people, men and women who are fleeing. Unfortunately, uh, we're unable to assist the administration and NATO stand aside because Vladimir Putin represents a nuclear threat. And my questions to you today are going to be about the nuclear threat that we face as a nation, not just the war that's, that's occurring in Ukraine, but how it affects us as we've had open threats from Vladimir Putin, both to our NATO allies and to the United States with respect to their nuclear capabilities. Now, President Obama in June, of 19, June 19, 2013, in his speech in Germany, called for a road to zero. Uh, unfortunately, as we now know, uh, there are more nuclear weapons today in the world than there were when President Obama uh, called for a road to zero. The U.S. capabilities, however, have not continued to grow. We've, it has continued to be neglected. And this administration has not sought to change our, our policies in a way that would strengthen our deterrent. Currently, there is a National Posture Review under, uh, ongoing, and I'm going to be asking you some questions about your involvement in that, your advice to those who are undertaking that National Posture Review, because the world is changing. We know that Russia, in the development of Skyfall, which is a nuclear orbiting uh, nuclear weapon, uh, Poseidon, which is an undersea uh, unmanned nuclear weapon that is supposed to pop up on the shores of a nation like the United States and attack uh, our, uh, our cities, and Vanguard with their hypersonic missiles, which are already deployed, China, which uh, has just demonstrated an, an orbital or suborbital hypersonic capability, uh, and China, who also has been identified as expanding their ICBM missile fields are all issues that need to be taken into consideration of the threats facing the United States. Now, the headlines have piled up. <clears throat> China threatens Australia with missile attack. North Korea threatens nuclear attack on Washington, D.C. North Korea threatens Japan with real ballistic missile. North Korea threatens to sink Japan, reduce U.S. to ashes and darkness. Israel threat, uh, Iran threatens to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And of course, now we have Putin who threats the West, and his statement was that he would unleash such consequences have never been seen in, in history. 
We saw in Hawaii, as there was a false alarm of a possible nuclear attack in Hawaii and the panic that ensued. What's in common with all of these countries, besides the fact that nuclear powers? There are also authoritarian regimes, and there are also countries that have terrible human rights records. They threaten our populace, they threaten their neighbors, and their nuclear capabilities are destabilizing and a threat to the United States. With our nuclear posture review, we have an opportunity to change both the investment in our nuclear capabilities so that we rise to the level of deterrent necessary as these nations threaten the United States and invest in the nuclear capabilities, but also in our missile defense capabilities. So I'm going to begin first with um, the nuclear posture review. Um, are any of you involved in the current nuclear posture review being undertaken by the Biden administration? Um, and um, also, what advice would you have for those who are undertaking the nuclear posture review as to what the United States needs to do differently so that we can deter these authoritarian regimes that are threatening the United States and allow Vladimir Putin uh, to threaten Ukraine and other allies uh, that are not part of NATO or our nuclear umbrella? No, oh, I'm sorry. This is, we're, uh, those, this are is the just ask, those are the questions I'm going to be asking you as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, I thank the, uh, the gentleman. Um, Director Haynes uh, uh, and uh, uh, members of the IC, you are recognized for your opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Schiff, Ranking Member Turner, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and to provide testimony alongside my wonderful colleagues from behalf of the intelligence community on the IC's 2022 assessment of worldwide threats to U.S. national security. Before I start, I just want to take a moment to express to you how much I've appreciated your thoughtful support and partnership this last year, and to publicly thank the men and women of the intelligence community for their extraordinary work to keep us safe. I know how privileged I am to be a part of the intelligence community this time of extraordinarily talented people and to be given a chance to do something useful in service to my country, and I thank you for the opportunity. Broadly speaking, the year's assessment focuses on adversaries and competitors, critical transnational threats, and conflicts and instability. These categories often overlap, and one of the key challenges of this era is assessing how many various threats and trends are likely to intersect, so as to identify where their interactions may result in fundamentally greater risk to our interests than one might otherwise expect, or where they introduce new opportunities. And the 2022 annual threat assessment highlights some of these connections as it provides the IC's baseline of the most pressing threats to U.S. national interests. The assessment starts with threats from key state actors, beginning with the People's Republic of China, which remains an unparalleled priority for the intelligence community, and then turns to Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And all four governments have demonstrated the capability and intent to promote their interest in ways that cut against U.S. interests and allied interests. The PRC is coming ever closer to being a peer competitor in areas of relevance to national security, is pushing to revise global norms and institutions to its advantage, and is challenging the United States in multiple arenas, but particularly economically, militarily, and technologically. China is especially effective at bringing together a coordinated whole-of-government approach to demonstrate its strength and to compel neighbors to acquiesce to its preferences, including its territorial and maritime claims and assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. President Xi Jinping and China's other leaders are determined to force unification with Taiwan on Beijing's terms. China would prefer coerced unification that avoids armed conflict, and it has been stepping up diplomatic, economic, military pressure on the island for years to isolate it and weaken confidence in its democratically elected leaders. And at the same time, Beijing is preparing to use military force if it decides this is necessary. The PRC is also engaged in the largest ever nuclear force expansion and arsenal diversification in its history, is working to match or exceed U.S. capabilities in space, and present the broadest, most active, and persistent cyber espionage threat to U.S. government and private sector networks. Russia, of course, also remains a critical priority and is a significant focus right now in light of President Putin's recent and tragic invasion of Ukraine, which has produced a shock to the geopolitical order with implications for the future that we are only beginning to understand but are sure to be consequential. 
The IC, as you know, provided warning of President Putin's plans, but this is a case where I think all of us wish we had been wrong. The invasion has, in fact, proceeded consistent with the plan we assessed the Russian military would follow, only they are facing significantly more resistance from the Ukrainians than they expected and encountering serious military shortcomings. Russia's failure to rapidly seize Kyiv and overwhelm Ukrainian forces has deprived Moscow of the quick military victory that it probably had originally expected would prevent the United States and NATO from being able to provide meaningful military aid to Ukraine. Moreover, we assess Moscow underestimated the strength of Ukraine's resistance and the degree of internal military challenges we are observing, which include an ill-constructed plan, morale issues, and considerable logistical issues. What is unclear at this stage is whether Russia will continue to pursue a maximalist plan to capture all or most of Ukraine, which we assess would require more resources, even as the Russian military has begun to loosen its rules of engagements to achieve their military objectives. And if they pursue the maximalist plan, we judge it will be especially challenging for the Russians to hold and control Ukrainian territory and install a sustainable pro-Russian regime in Kyiv in the face of what we assess is likely to be a persistent and significant insurgency. And of course, the human toll of the conflict is already considerable and only increasing. Thus far, the Russian and Ukrainian militaries have probably suffered thousands of casualties along with numerous civilian deaths, and of course, well more than a million people have fled Ukraine since Russia invaded. Moreover, Russian forces are at the very least operating with reckless disregard for the safety of non-combatants. As Russian units launch artillery and airstrikes into urban areas as they have done in cities across Ukraine and near critical infrastructure such as the Enerhodar nuclear plant, and the IC is engaged across the interagency to document and hold Russia and Russian actors accountable for their actions. The reaction to the invasion from countries around the world has been severe. Western unity in imposing far-reaching sanctions and export controls as well as foreign commercial decisions are having cascading effects on the Russian economy. The economic crisis that Russia is experiencing is also exacerbating the domestic political opposition to Putin's decision to invade. And NATO's unified response, the significant resistance that the Ukrainians have demonstrated in the battlefield, Europe's rapid response to Russia's invasion, not just in terms of economic measures, but also actions long thought to be off the table, such as the provision of lethal aid to Ukraine, shutting down EU airspace to Russian planes, almost certainly surprised Moscow. In particular, while Putin probably anticipated many of the current sanctions to be imposed while he, when he weighed the cost of the invasion, we judged that he did not anticipate either the degree to which the United States and its allies and partners would take steps to undermine his capacity to mitigate Western actions, or the pullback from Russia initiated by non-state actors in the private sector. And nevertheless, our analysts assess that Putin is unlikely to be deterred by such setbacks and instead may escalate, essentially doubling down to achieve Ukrainian disarmament and neutrality to prevent it from further integrating with the US and NATO if it doesn't reach some diplomatic negotiation. We assess Putin feels aggrieved the West does not give him proper deference and perceives this as a war he cannot afford to lose. But what he might be willing to accept as a victory may change over time given the significant costs he is incurring. Putin's nuclear saber rattling is very much in line with this assessment. Putin's public announcement that he ordered Russia's strategic nuclear forces to go on special alert in response to aggressive statements, as he called them, from NATO leaders was extremely unusual. We have not seen a public announcement from the Russians regarding a heightened nuclear alert status since the 1960s, but we also have not observed force-wide nuclear posture changes that go beyond what we have seen in prior moments of heightened tensions during the last few decades. Our analysts assess that Putin's current posturing in this arena is probably intended to deter the West from providing additional support to Ukraine as he weighs an escalation of the conflict. Putin probably still remains confident that Russia can militarily defeat Ukraine and wants to prevent Western support from tipping the balance and forcing a conflict with NATO. And regardless, our number one intelligence priority is defense of the homeland, and we will remain vigilant in monitoring every aspect of Russia's strategic nuclear forces. With tensions this high, there is always an enhanced potential for miscalculation, unintended escalation, which we hope our intelligence can help to mitigate. Furthermore, beyond its invasion of Ukraine, Moscow presents a serious cyber threat, a key space competitor, and one of the most serious foreign influence threats to the United States. 
Using its intelligence services, proxies, and wide-ranging influence tools, the Russian government seeks to not only pursue its own interests, but also to divide Western alliances, undermine U.S. global standing, amplify discord inside the United States, and influence U.S. voters and decision-making. And to finish with our state actor threats, Iran continues to threaten U.S. interests as it tries to erode U.S. influence in the Middle East, entrench its influence and project power in neighboring states, and minimize threats to regime stability. Meanwhile, Kim Jong-un continues to steadily expand and enhance Pyongyang, Pyongyang's nuclear and conventional capabilities, targeting the United States and its allies, periodically using aggressive and potentially destabilizing actions to reshape the regional security environment in his favor and to reinforce his status as a de facto nuclear power. The assessment focuses next on a number of key global and transnational threats, including global health security, transnational organized crime, the rapid development of destabilizing technologies, climate, migration, and terrorism. And I raise these because they pose challenges of a fundamentally different nature in our national security than those posed by the actions of nation states, even powerful ones like China. We look at the Russia-Ukraine war and can imagine outcomes to resolve the crisis, the steps needed to get there, even though they are unpalatable and difficult. And similarly, we view the array of challenges Chinese actions pose and can discuss what is required and how we think about trade-offs. But transnational issues are more complex, require multilateral collaboration, and although we can discuss ways of managing them, all of them pose a set of choices that will be more difficult to untangle and will perhaps require more sacrifice to bring about meaningful change. This reflects not just the interconnected nature of the problems, but also the significant impact increasingly empowered non-state actors have on the outcomes, and the reality that some of the countries who are key to mitigating threats posed by nation states are also the ones we will be asking to do more in the transnational space. And for example, the lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is putting a strain on governments and societies, fueling humanitarian and economic crises, political unrest, geopolitical competition as countries such as China and Russia, seek to exploit the crisis to their own advantage. And no country has been completely spared. And even when a vaccine is widely distributed globally, the economic and political aftershocks will be felt for years. Low-income countries with high debts face particularly challenging recoveries and the potential for cascading crises that lead to regional instability, whereas others will turn inward or be distracted by other challenges. These shifts will spur migration around the world, including on our southern border. The economic impact has set many poor and middle-income countries back years in terms of economic development and is encouraging some in Latin America, Africa, and Asia to look to China and Russia for quick economic and security assistance to manage their new reality. We see the same complex mix of interlocking challenges stemming from climate change, which is exacerbating risks to U.S. national security interests across the board, but particularly as it intersects with environmental degradation and global health challenges. And terrorism, of course, remains a persistent threat to U.S. persons and interests at home and abroad, and yet the implications of the problem are evolving. In Africa, for example, where terrorist groups are clearly gaining strength, the growing overlap between terrorism, criminal activity, smuggling networks has undermined stability, contributed to coups, and an erosion of democracy and resulted in countries turning to Russian entities to help manage these problems. Global transnational criminal organizations continue to pose a direct threat to the United States through the production and trafficking of lethal illicit drugs, massive theft, including cybercrime, human trafficking, and financial crimes, and money laundering schemes. In particular, the threat from illicit drugs is at historic levels, with more than 100,000 American drug overdose deaths for the first time annually, driven mainly by a robust supply of synthetic opioids from Mexican transnational criminal organizations. In short, the interconnected global security environment is marked by the growing specter of great power, competition, and conflict, while transnational threats to all nations and actors compete not only for our attention, but also our finite resources. And finally, the assessment turns to conflicts and instability, highlighting a series of regional challenges of importance to the United States. Iterative violence between Israel and Iran, conflicts in other areas, including Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, have the potential to escalate or spread, fueling humanitarian crises and threatening U.S. persons. Africa, for example, has seen six irregular transfers of power since 2020, and probably will see new bouts of conflict in the coming year as the region becomes increasingly strained by a volatile mixture of democratic backsliding, intercommunal violence, and the continued threat of cross-border terrorism. 
We are also focused on our workforce and their families. The IC continues to contribute to the government-wide effort to better understand potential causal mechanisms of anomalous health incidents and remains committed to ensuring afflicted individuals receive the quality care they need. The safety and well-being of our workforce is our highest priority, and we are grateful to members of this committee for your continued support on this issue. And in closing, I just want to note how much effort has gone into improving our capacity to share intelligence and analysis with our partners and allies across the intelligence community. We have seen in our approach to the threat to Ukraine, the sharing of intelligence and analysis has paid real dividends in helping to facilitate collective action against the renewed threat of nation-state aggression. And while such efforts must be done with care to ensure we are able to protect our sources and methods, we are laying the groundwork to broaden our work where doing so creates the conditions for a more united focus on other emerging challenges. And we appreciate your support in these efforts as well. Thank you. We look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that um, sober assessment of the challenges that we face. Russia is encountering greater resistance uh, than expected in Ukraine. And suffering significant setbacks in the face of a highly determined Ukrainian resistance. Nevertheless, there is no sign that Putin is looking for de-escalation. Uh, indeed, an increasingly brutal Russian campaign suggests that Putin is doubling down. Uh, Director Burns, you've dealt with Putin for many years. Um, first of all, what's your assessment of how many Russian soldiers have thus far been killed uh, and how many injured? Uh, and based on your experience uh, with Putin, what would it take to change Putin's calculus in Ukraine? <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think Putin is determined to dominate and control Ukraine to shape its orientation. Um, you know, this is a matter of deep personal conviction for him. He's been stewing in a combustible combination of grievance and ambition for many years. Um, that personal conviction matters more than ever in the Russian system. He's created a system in which his own circle of advisors is narrower and narrower. COVID has made that even narrower. Um, and it's a system in which it's not proven career enhancing for people to question or challenge his judgment. So he's gone to war, I think, on the basis, Mr. Chairman, of a number of assumptions which led him to believe that he faced, that Russia faced, a favorable landscape for the use of force against Ukraine this winter. First, that Ukraine, in his view, was weak and easily intimidated. Second, that the Europeans, especially the French and Germans, were distracted by elections in France and a leadership succession in Germany and risk averse. Third, he believed he had sanctions proofed his economy um, in, in the sense of creating a large war chest of foreign currency reserves. And fourth, he was confident that he had modernized his military and they were capable of a quick, decisive victory at minimal cost. Um, he's been proven wrong on every count. Those assumptions have proven to be profoundly flawed over the last 12 days of conflict. President Zelensky, is, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, as the ranking member mentioned, um, has risen to the moment and demonstrated courageous and remarkable leadership, and Ukrainians have resisted fiercely. Um, second, um, the Europeans have demonstrated remarkable resolve, um, especially the Germans. Third, uh, the economic consequences of the sanctions which have been enacted so far have proven to be devastating for Russia, especially against the Russian Central Bank, um, depriving Putin of the ability that he assumed he'd have to defend the ruble. And fourth, his own military's performance has been largely ineffective. Instead of seizing Kiev within the first two days of the campaign, which was what his plan was premised upon, after nearly two weeks, they still have not been able to fully encircle the city. And so, you know, Putin has, has commented privately and publicly over the years that he doesn't believe Ukraine's a real country. Well, he's dead wrong about that. Real countries fight back. And that's what the Ukrainians have done quite heroically over the last 12 days. Um, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I think Putin is angry and frustrated right now. He's likely to double down and try to grind down the Ukrainian military with no regard for civilian casualties. But the challenge that he faces, and this is the biggest question that's hung over our analysis of his planning for months now, as the director, as Director Haynes said, is he has no sustainable political endgame in the face of what is going to continue to be fierce resistance from Ukrainians. So I think that's what his calculus 
um, has been, and I think the re that's the reality of what he faces today. In terms of casualties, I, I know um, General Barry may want to comment on that, but there have been far in excess Russian military casualties killed and wounded, far in excess of what he anticipated, because his military planning and assumptions was premised on a quick, decisive victory, um, and uh, that has not proven to be the case. Dr. Barry, are you able, are you able to comment on that? And also, um, in this massive column uh, heading toward Kyiv, now maybe two massive columns, um, public reports suggest that they've run out of fuel. Um, are we learning that the Russian military is uh, far less competent than we imagined? Um, how do you assess their performance thus far? Chairman, I, I think the, uh, the Russian army reformed into this thing we call the New Look Army. And they, they task organize themselves into smaller battalion tactical groups. And fundamentally, that, that is not a bad uh, construct. I think they had a bad plan. And I think their <clears throat> logistic support is not what it needs to be to, uh, to develop the situation that they wanted to do it. We, we can go into much more detail on that in, in the closed session. Are you, are you able to say in open session how many uh, Russian troops have been killed? With, with low confidence, uh, somewhere between two and 4,000. That number comes from some intelligence sources, but uh, also open source uh, and how we pull that together. Um, Director Burns, whatever Putin's plan may have been on the way in, um, if that plan involved the, the installation of a puppet regime, that seems highly implausible now. Um, how does this end? Um, well, that's the core question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think Putin's assumptions, as I said before, have turned out to be profoundly flawed. I fail to see, and our analysts fail to see, how he could sustain a puppet regime or a you know, pro-Russian leadership that he tries to install in the face of what is you know, massive opposition from the Ukrainian people. In many ways, it's been Putin's aggression, going back to 2014 in Crimea, that's created the strong sense of Ukrainian nationhood and sovereignty that he faces today. So I, I fail to see how he can produce that kind of an endgame. And where that leads, I think, is, is for an ugly next few weeks in which he doubles down, as I said before, with scant regard for civilian casualties in which urban fighting can get even uglier. Because the one thing I'm absolutely convinced of, and I think our analysts across the intelligence community are absolutely convinced of, is the Ukrainians are going to continue to resist fiercely and effectively. Finally, um, either Director Ray or Director Nakasone, um, what do you anticipate uh, Russian, Russia might do to lash out the United States in the cyber realm? Um, and, uh, and to what degree do you think they can use cryptocurrency to evade uh, sanctions? Uh, so let me start uh, with a series of uh, scenarios, Chairman. Uh, as we take a look at it, uh, we're very, very focused on ransomware actors that, that might, uh, that might um, uh, conduct uh, attacks against our allies, our nation. Very, very focused on uh, some type of um, um, cyber activity that's designed for perhaps Ukraine that spreads more broadly uh, into other countries. Third is any type of uh, attack that, uh, that uh, an adversary would conduct against an ally. And then finally, certainly our critical infrastructure. Those are really the, the areas that we look at so carefully. It's done with a series of partners. It's interagency partners. It's, it's our partners that uh, exist in the private sector. It's with obviously a series of partners that are allied as well. But those are the scenarios that, that we certainly walk our way through. Uh, I would agree with that. I would just add two things, uh, perhaps. One is we're, we're very concerned about the risk of spillover effect. In other words, even if the Russians uh, think they have carefully calibrated some form of uh, malicious cyber activity against our critical infrastructure, uh, the reality is they've shown a history of not being able to kind of manage the effects of it uh, as well as they intend, even if you give them the benefit of the doubt, which I tend not to. Uh, so for example, the NotPetya attack uh, is kind of widely viewed as one of the most destructive attacks uh, in the history uh, of the world, and that's a GRU attack that, that had that kind of spillover effect. So that's something we're deeply concerned about. Uh, and then the second, uh, General Nakasone mentioned ransomware. Uh, obviously, we are concerned about cyber criminals, many of whom uh, are based in Russia either acting in support of the Russian government, as we've seen, for example, the declaration by the well-known ransomware gang Conti 
declaring its intention to act in support of the Russian government against the Russian government's adversaries, uh, or who are taking advantage of perhaps the more permissive operating environment that now exists uh, in the middle of this conflict to, uh, to attack us in, through cyber criminal means. Thank you. Well, perhaps we can get into cryptocurrency later in the hearing. Uh, Rep. Ranking Member Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to personally thank Director Haynes and Director Burns uh, for your bipartisan uh, work, the way you have done outreach, the way you have assured every one of this committee uh, of your absolute commitment uh, to the national security of this nation. Um, thank you for your service and thank you for your expertise uh, at a time when the world is, is once again seeing war in, in Europe. Um, as I indicated in my opening statement, uh, my questions are going to relate to the nuclear threat and the worldwide threat. Director Haynes, you mentioned uh, the, the nuclear threat in your opening statement. Um, so my question first to um, Director Haynes, Burns, and General Barrier relates to Vladimir Putin and his, his statements themselves. Um, he has stated uh, that if anyone entered the conflict that he would escalate um, including uh, nuclear attacks as part of his exercises prior to entering into Ukraine. He included a nuclear weapons component. Uh, he's been very boisterous about uh, his modernization of his nuclear weapons and the new capabilities that, uh, that they're seeking, including the hypersonics uh, which they, and the Vanguard, which they now have deployed. So my first question to the three of you is, um, do you believe him? Do you believe that, that if the United States or its NATO allies uh, entered uh, this conflict to protect the innocents that Vladimir Putin is killing in this unprovoked tact, uh, that it could escalate and that he would be willing to escalate this conflict uh, to a nuclear conflict? Uh, Director Haynes, Burns, and General Barrier. Thank you, Ranking Member Turner, and thank you for the way you've worked with us as well, by the way. I, um, I'd say we can obviously go into this in further detail in closed session, but as a general matter, um, you know, as I indicated, his public statement about the special alert status, which by the way is not a technical term as we understand it within their system, um, it doesn't uh, relate to a specific alert status within their system, was very unusual, and we obviously take it very seriously when he's signaling in this way. But we do think, as I indicated, says that that he is effectively signaling, that he's attempting to deter, and uh, that he has done that in other ways, for example, having the strategic nuclear forces exercise that we indicated had been postponed until February begin then as a method of effectively deterring using his nuclear forces as a way to say this could escalate and therefore NATO should not get involved and that that's been his main purpose in doing so. And, you know, again, as indicated, we're watching very closely for movements, anything related to his strategic nuclear forces, and we're not seeing something at this stage that indicates that he is doing something different than what we've seen in the past. And I think that's probably as much as I could say, and I'll leave it to others. No, the only thing I'd add, um, Congressman, is that, you know, in, in response to your direct question about a scenario in which NATO and the United States were directly involved in military conflict with Russia, you know, Russian doctrine holds that, you know, you escalate to de-escalate. And so I think the risk would rise, according to that doctrine, of uh, in extremis, you know, the Russian leadership considering uh, the use of tactical nuclear weapons. But I, I stress that that's only in that specific circumstance that you described of a direct military conflict between NATO and Russia. Just a couple of thoughts, Ranking Member. Um, Putin has invested very wisely in these niche weapons, and you, you mentioned some of them in your uh, opening statement. Um, I, I believe that he thinks that gives him uh, an asymmetric advantage, and he's also invested in tactical uh, nuclear weapons. I also believe that when he says something, we should listen very, very carefully and maybe take him at his word. So th this question is the one that analysts are pondering right now, and I, I think we, we uh, really need to do some more work on it. I'm happy to digest this more in the closed session. Great. Well, I appreciate, uh, General Barry, your, your statement, because that actually goes to my next question. Um, <clears throat> because of the modernization that has occurred, um, by Vladimir Putin uh, in the nuclear infrastructure of Russia, I believe, as you have, have stated, uh, that it has emboldened him, um, meaning that he believes he's buying himself an edge. 
Uh, the United States is currently undertaking our nuclear posture review where we're going to look at our modernization programs, our policies, uh, including uh, we're, we're doing a missile defense review, which uh, obviously is important whenever you're, you're considering someone else's escalatory um, nuclear threat. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of the three of you, um, you know, are you directly involved in the nuclear posture review, and what would your advice be, knowing that we now have uh, authoritarian regimes that are making opening statements, excuse me, open statements about um, threatening their neighbors, the use of nuclear weapons, uh, and Vladimir Putin changing, um, you know, his, his posture, and China significantly investing in both their ICBM um, <laughs> fields and in their hypersonics. Uh, what should we be doing with our nuclear posture review so that we can deter these authoritarian regimes in the future? Director Haynes, Burns, and General Barrier. Thank you. So uh, my staff and ODI and i is involved in the nuclear posture review, as am I in the context of principals meetings on these discussions. Our, our role, however, is not a policy role. So I don't provide and did not provide my advice uh, as to whether or not to take a particular posture in the, the review. Um, what we do is provide essentially the intelligence community's assessments on issues that were asked about in the context of that review. Before we go to Director Burns, would, would, uh, would it be correct to characterize that, that likely your assessment is that the threat is increasing? That the threat is increasing generally, yes. I, I think that's fair. Director Burns. No, all I would ask, I absolutely agree that the threat is increasing, and I think our role is to try to provide insight from the intelligence community into the plans, the ambitions, the pace at which, you know, adversaries, whether it's China or Russia, can move on these issues. And all I would add is that I think it's very important for us not to underestimate the pay, either the scope of those ambitions or the pace at which they can move. I think China and hypersonics is one example of that. Ranking member, I do believe that the threat is increasing. We are involved in the study, and, and our role is to is to really provide the best foundational military intelligence we have related to these kinds of weapons, facilities, organizations, and doctrine that we can, so that policymakers can can make the right decision. Director Haynes and Burns, um, obviously, people are very concerned about the negotiations ongoing with the JCPOA and the future nuclear threat uh, from Iran. Uh, concerns relate to uh, re-entering an agreement that had some flawed provisions, including um, not um, missiles were not encompassed in the original terms, and that some very critical terms of the agreement were expiring. Can you give us any information about the ongoing uh, negotiations from the administration as to whether or not it's just re-enter the old agreement that is has expiring terms and does not cover their ability? to seek ICBM technology, or are we undertaking actual negotiations uh, to try to reach a better agreement? Thank you, Ranking Member. I, we obviously, um, again, provide analysis that we hope is helpful to the policymakers in the conduct of the negotiations. I, I don't really have uh, you know, more information beyond the fact that they're obviously engaged in the negotiations and looking to do, I think, uh, what the president has indicated, which is to say both to deal with the nuclear file but also to deal with other issues that Iran has uh, been a destabilizing factor in. But I'll leave it to others. Uh, the, the only thing um, I would add, sir, is that, you know, I, having spent many years negotiating on these issues with the Iranians, which is probably where I got most of my white hair, um, you know, I, my nostalgia is under control for those negotiations. They're incredibly difficult. And as Director Haynes said, you know, we always have to be mindful of the fact that the threat that this Iranian regime poses is not only about the nuclear issue or even the missile issue, as you rightly emphasized. It's also you know, a threat to our interests across the Middle East and the interests of our partners in the Middle East as well. And, you know, re regardless of, of how the negotiations over the JCPOA go, I think those challenges are still going to be with all of us. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, Mr. Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here, and a big thank you to your people who are doing such great work all over the world. I'd intended to use my time this morning to explore the state of our cybersecurity, which is more important today than ever. Um, but this weekend in Connecticut, at rally after rally and conversation after conversation, I was swept up in the tidal wave of outrage over Putin's illegal and unconscionable brutality in Ukraine. 
And my constituents want to know just one thing, which is what more can we do? They understand that this is not just a fight between Russia and Ukraine. They understand that this is the bleeding edge of the war between free democracies and savage authoritarianism. And they also understand that we're late to this fight. Under the Trump administration, the world witnessed four years of attacks on NATO and its members, four years of coddling and believing and supporting Vladimir Putin, and four years of ridiculing Ukraine with a series of ever more bizarre conspiracy theories. As Russia tightened its noose around Ukraine, President Trump made it clear to Ukrainian President Zelensky during a phone call in July of 2019 that the military aid that Zelensky so badly needed would be stopped until Zelensky did him a favor. So my point is that we've got a special burden right now to make that right, because we're late to this fight. So Director Haynes, and I'd also like to hear from Director Burns, I know you have to answer this very carefully, but it's the question my constituents have. What resources, what dedication, what plan, what strategy are you applying in your entities to help us win this fight? I know it's very hard to be specific, but the more you can give an Amer the American people a feel for what you are doing in this fight, we'd be very grateful to understand that. Director Haynes, and I would like to hear from uh, Director Burns as well. Thank you. I suspect you'd get a lot from everybody actually on the panel on this issue. I, we are. Um, and I will try to find a way to, to characterize things, but I'm sure my colleagues will be better at this. I, um, we obviously, first and foremost, want to be able to provide as much information about what's actually happening. And I think one of the challenges in the context of what's occurred is the fact that um, Russia and President Putin is clearly uh, promoting a particular narrative about what they're doing. And uh, one of the values, I think, of the intelligence community during this scenario has been that we've been able to expose that narrative as false and ultimately indicate that what they are promoting as a pretext for their war of choice is in fact just that, a pretext. And I think as we- hey, Director, let me stop you there very quickly because I think this is an important point. Are they done with their false flag operations? What might we expect to see in that regard? Yeah, I think- as I was going to say, I just think as this continues, we're going to continue to see them essentially spinning narratives that are uh, false, and we hopefully can provide some credible voice of what is actually happening as we move forward. And I think that's both for their domestic population, but that's also for the international audience as well. And in many respects, as I indicated in my opening statement, one of the things that we are focused on is ensuring that we can provide as much information as possible to hold Russians accountable for the actions they're taking right now in Ukraine, doing things that I think are largely unacceptable to many. So I'll leave it at that and give it to Bill. No, all I, I, all I would add, sir, is that we have no higher priority as an agency right now than providing all the support that we can to the Ukrainians. Glad to talk about that more in closed session. In this session, I would just reinforce what um, Avril said, and that is that you know, I think you know, the work that we've done, and it's not without risk, as an intelligence community uh, to declassify information has been very effective. I sat for many years on the policymaking side of the table, and I've seen us lose information wars. And in this case, I think by being careful about this, we have uh, stripped away the pretext that Putin in particular often uses. That's been a real benefit, I think, to Ukrainians. It's been a real investment in the kind of actions that our allies have taken. The only other thing I'd add is that, you know, we've done intensive intelligence sharing and we continue to with the Ukrainians, including when I saw President Zelensky in January in Kiev, we shared with him intelligence we had at the time about some of the most uh, graphic and uh, concerning details of Russian planning about Kiev as well. And, and we've continued to do that every day since then. Thank you. So one of the remarkable aspects, historical aspects, about the last couple of months has been the fact that the IC has, in fact, anticipated and shared with the world what spinning, what false flag might look like. In my very limited time, what might we expect to see? What would it look like if the Russians continued to spin or run false flag operations? Um, no, I, I think, as Director Haynes said, we're, they're going to continue to try to spin this and create false narratives. You've seen things that the Russians have said before, senior Russian officials, alleging that there'd be chemical weapons attacks, for example, 
um, in the Donbas or elsewhere. And I think that just gives you a flavor of the kind of things that they could easily try to fabricate uh, or float in the future, particularly as they get more desperate about you know, their own, at least up until this point, relative military ineffectiveness. Th thank you very much. I yield back. Dr. Wenstrup. Well, thank you very much. You know, I view our role on this committee is to serve as partners in the protection of America and her citizens. Uh, our role is to work with you on this committee, as we have many experienced and talented members here. And I want to uh, thank most of you that I've been able to have one-on-one -on -one engagements with. Uh, it is greatly appreciated because it's been an opportunity to allow for some very frank exchanges. So I compliment you for that. And it's important, too, as you know, that the intelligence community across America and within this committee has a trust because these agencies that you represent exist for the American people, bottom line. So I appreciate you being here today and presenting and actually having the opportunity in this open setting to present in front of the, uh, the American people. You know, our goal in, in the intelligence community is to gather information so that we can be able to thwart damage or harm, to secure our nation, to provide for peace, and to deter our enemies. So I do want to take a second to praise the very excellent work that you all have done on the Ukrainian-Russian situation, the predictability of what Russia was going to do. I do have to take a little exception to what my friend Mr. Himes had to say because under the Obama administration, we provided Ukraine with blankets and MREs. Under the Trump administration, we very much strengthened NATO and provided javelins. But our goal is for deterrence. Deterrence requires action. And actions, uh, I haven't seen actions taken that really have deterred or thwarted the Russian offensive since this all began since it became known what Russia was planning to do. I see actions speak louder than words, and actions require results. Unfortunately, I feel that recent actions by our government seemingly aided and abetted the Russians, because energy and money are keys to the kinetic attacks and the capabilities of what Russia is now doing. So we've had this information, but in, but in that same time frame, we have weakened our energy. We have enhanced Russians' energy capabilities and their monies. In essence, we paid them to become stronger. Now, this is sad news for Ukraine, and it's sad news for the free world. So again, I want to applaud what you do and what you have done. You've provided the intelligence. If I can shift a little bit, and going to the annual threat assessment and look at uh, advances in technology that could lead to novel biological weapons. Uh, there's global labs that have some of the deadliest pathogens in China and Russia, and the development of a novel biological weapon could certainly complicate detection, attribution, and treatment of, of such uh, uh, threats. So the assessment notes that novel weapons could complicate detection and attribution, but I'd like to point out that uncooperative nations also complicate things, as we've seen from Beijing when trying to investigate the origins of COVID. So my questions are, what have we learned over the last couple of years from our response to and preparedness or lack thereof for the COVID-19 global pandemic that could help inform our response in the future? And what steps are we taking either by ourselves or with our allies to ensure that we're able to fully investigate these matters should the need arise. Thank you very much, Representative Wenstrup. Uh, I'll start and others may have more to add, but I think, honestly, I think we've learned a lot, certainly in ODNI and i and in the intelligence community on this issue. I, among the things that we've learned is the fact that um, we did not and still do not, frankly, have the internal expertise that we want to have on essentially bio issues, and that is something we're working hard to promote. 
and uh, and we have developed things like um, uh, experts groups and so on that allow us to tap into expertise more easily in academia and uh, in the private sector and otherwise. But that is something that um, I think needs to be expanded and recruiting the right folks is a critical aspect of this. You've also set up in legislation the opportunity for public-private partnership talent programs and that's something that we're trying to effectively uh, utilize and um, I think having an opportunity for folks to go in and out is critically important. Um, we have also established uh, a national intelligence manager for health in, in this space, that um, health security that helps in this area. And I think uh, part of what we've been trying to do is make sure that we're drawing from across the IC because in, in really an extraordinary number of elements, certainly everybody that you see here before you um, has expertise and knowledge and making sure that we can connect it together and be more effective and proficient in ultimately providing policymakers with an understanding of what's happening and also how it is that um, that may translate into biological warfare and other things that are obviously of, of great and core interest to us. So I'll stop there and let others say anything they have. Representative Weinstrup, I would just say DIA's role uh, in this is, is duty to warn. And so for the Department of Defense, we must have our eyes out, our ears out, and be able to, uh, to understand this when it happens. For, for us and the lessons that we have learned, uh, this is a really hard intelligence problem, and we have to be able to take advantage of all of the sources that are out there, and certainly open source tools to be able to get insight early um, has been very, very effective, and we're going to continue to develop those with our National Center for Medical Intelligence and continue to invest in those kinds of tools. I thank you about the yield back. Yes, sir. Mr. Winstrup, all, all I would add, as we've discussed before, is, you know, we, we've created a new mission center at CIA, which is focused largely on the question that you raised of emerging technologies designed both to help policymakers, um, you know, anticipate the pace at which our adversaries are moving, especially on issues like synthetic biology or biotechnology, and also to deepen partnership with the private sector so we better understand the pace of innovation in that area as well. Thank you very much. Yield back. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Director Haynes and Director Ray, one of the struggles over the past uh, several years has been to detect and understand the nature of foreign efforts uh, to influence U.S. politics, including and especially grassroots groups. Uh, the Mueller report, for example, identified dozens of U.S. rallies organized by a Russian troll farm. Director Haynes, is support to U.S. grassroots groups still a part of the foreign malign influence playbook and which adversaries use it? And Director Ray, um, how do we stop foreign covert influence on grassroots activist groups without silencing legitimate political speech? Thank you. I'll be quick because I would say that the FBI's work in this area is obviously critical, but, uh, but yes, in the sense that we do see with foreign malign influence efforts to support particular groups within the United States at times, and those are links that we obviously focus in on and try to provide to uh, those parts of the government that are then able to act on issues. Uh, I think I would say that it, uh, it does continue to be a phenomenon. We should expect it to continue to be a threat. Um, the Russians obviously were among the first to, to do it very aggressively, but we've seen other adversaries uh, get increasingly interested in taking a page out of that same playbook. Uh, we, of course, have the Foreign Influence Task Force that we set up that's designed to try to address uh, that. I think the key point to your question about balancing uh, is that our focus is on the malign foreign influence, not on the resulting speech. So sometimes I think people get confused about that, and I think that if we see some kind of aggressive activity here, grassroots or otherwise, that we're somehow reverse engineering back to figure out if it could be explained by some foreign source, the Russians, the Iranians, whoever. We actually go at it in reverse. We're aggressively investigating foreign intelligence services, their proxies, their uh, uh, social media accounts, things like that. And then if that then turns out to manifest itself in activity here, then we're going after it that way. We are not, and we don't intend to be, the speech or truth police, but we are aggressively working with foreign partners to identify foreign, malign foreign influence sources, uh, and where appropriate, we're sharing information with social media companies who can then uh, reduce the bullhorn effect of fake 
accounts that are actually you know, part of a Russian troll farm or, or in some other way uh, uh, inauthentic accounts. And we've actually done some of that in context of the current crisis with the Ukraine uh, at the Ukrainians' request to uh, work with social media companies to take down fake Russian accounts that are spreading uh, Ukrainian military disinformation. Thank you all. I yield back, Chairman. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To all of you again, thank you for a lifetime of service. Uh, I look forward to the closed session where we can go in more detail on some of these topics, as I'm sure you do as well. But this is an important session because we can speak to the American people. You can speak to the American people about the threats that we are facing. It's a chance to remind them, although I think the last few weeks have clearly done the reminding for us about the threats that we face around the world. It's, it, to talk about almost anything else seems quite tone deaf because of the focus of the American people on that. And that's why, although I have some questions that are unrelated to the current situation in Ukraine, I, I think there's some other work that we need to mention as well. But again, it gives a chance for you to highlight your agencies and the great work you do, and I'm, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and, and for the benefit of the American people as well, there are some other, as I said, other issues that I think we should talk about, although briefly, then I want to reserve as much of my time as I can to come back to the Ukraine. Director Haynes and really all of you, in the last year we went through this thing that made several of us on the committee very uncomfortable in the sense that there was a DHS and FBI mandate to report on domestic violent extremists or extremism. Director, that mandated that you, or you chose to at that point on March 21st, to release a standalone report, which is something quite unusual for to take an, an issue, a single issue like that, <clears throat> with a standalone report from the DNI talking again about domestic violent extremism. And there's obviously a lot of work, a, a lot of intense analysis, which again, the reason that I'm concerned about that, as, I, as I've expressed, I think, all of you, is a sense we should never turn the awesome power of the, of the CIA or the awesome power of the NSA on American persons. And I believe that you all agree with that. And it seemed like we were approaching that line. Interestingly, in this most recent report, do you know how many times DBEs are mentioned? Zero. Not a single time. Which is, begs the question, I mean, there's a couple perhaps explanations. One of them is that we fixed the problem which seems unlikely. I've never seen an example where one report highlights something as this is a intense area of issue for us, and the next year it's not mentioned at all. I'm afraid that, uh, that the work last year was a result of political pressure. And I, I wonder if any one of you would like to perhaps offer an, offer an explanation for why it was so important a year ago and yet doesn't make it into the report at all in this, in this most recent. Sure, I can start. I, so it is mentioned, it's just under a, a, a separate name. You'll see it, we talk about racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism, and that is a form of, in many respects, domestic violent extremism obviously can occur in other places, but it also occurs domestically. And it, it does remain a problem, but I, I will turn to uh, Director Ray to talk about how much of a problem. Well, from the FBI perspective, domestic violent extremism, of course, is, is central to our mission, separate and apart from authorities that others in the intelligence community might have, and, and we're aggressively pursuing it, and it remains a, a very significant high priority. And, Director, I agree with that, that you should, as the director of the FBI, have that responsibility. What made us uncomfortable was we were doing it within the framework of many assets and, and the efforts of those within the intelligence community which once again, we should have a very clear line between those two efforts. If I could, in the minute I have left, Director, uh, according to some open source reporting, the FBI purchased NSO spyware Pegasus in 2019 and evaluated the program under a name called Phantom. D can you confirm that, you know, if that's, if that's true or not? Uh, what I can tell you is that the FBI has not and did not use uh, the NSO products uh, operationally in any investigation. I can confirm that we bought a limited license for testing and evaluation. So not used in any investigation of anyone, but rather as part of our routine responsibilities to evaluate technologies that are out there, not just from a perspective of could they be used someday legally, but also more importantly, what are the security concerns 
raised by those products. So very different from using it to investigate so, anyone. So I, so I understand that you did purchase a program and you tested it. Is that accurate? We had a limited license for testing and evaluation. We've tested and evaluated, and that's, did, that's did, over. It hasn't did, been used in any investigation of anyone. Did the FBI ever notify Congress of their intention to test this product? That I don't know the answer to. I can look into that. Uh, Please do, because sure uh, we're, we're unaware of any notification. And then <clears throat> why would we test a product such as that if you don't have the intention to use it? Well, we test. Uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked. We, we test and evaluate all sorts of technologies and products that, if in the wrong hands, can be used against our agents, for example, conducting their operations. So part of it is from a, uh, a counterintelligence security perspective, we need to know what tools are out there that the bad guys can use against our people. So that's part of why we test and evaluate, because it allows us to inform our own countermeasures and things like that. Okay, and my time has expired, but are you saying then that you would never intend to use that against U.S. persons only for counterintelligence? Is that true? We decided not to use it. Even before the current uh, and brouhaha, we decided not to use it for any purpose uh, other than just the, the one I've already referred to. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your response. I yield back. Representative Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've heard reference today that uh, we were late to the game. NATO was late to the game. Uh, I do want to applaud the administration and NATO, uh, particularly NATO, which is moving in light years for NATO to move and change uh, what Germany has never done before, what Switzerland and others have never done before. But I think that begs the question is, are we still late to the key point here? Uh, I reference that because of the speech we saw Saturday by President Zelensky. It reminded me of Churchill during the Blitz, and, and here's why. Churchill wasn't just talking about his home country, as was Zelensky. He was talking about all of Europe. He was talking about the ideal of sovereign democratic countries and why you cannot let autocratic fascist countries take them over. But we've always had this discussion about what we should do, prefaced on the notion, well, they're not part of NATO, therefore. In the final analysis, Ukraine, what they represent and what they have done so far, represents the highest ideals personification of what we wanted NATO to be. And for us to say with the greatest respect that we will fight for every inch of NATO territory, when Ukraine has done the real thing and face being wiped off the face of the earth. I think we need to think about getting to that final point and recognizing and treating Ukraine for that which they have earned. And I know that that's a, a big move, but if we're going to get there anyway, uh, because of what we are about to witness in the coming weeks, do we still want to be behind the curve? Um, but as we move forward, let me just ask a few points. Uh, in 2019, the Director Coates said that Russia and China were more aligned uh, than at any point since the mid-1950s, and the relationship is likely to strengthen. Uh, Director Haynes, let me ask you, do you believe that's still the case? Was it more the case before this invasion? Has this changed that calculus? And uh, do we believe that Beijing is looking at this uh, as surprised, perhaps, as Putin was of the Western response? Thank you, uh, Representative. I think Director Coates was exactly right. I believe that it continues to be the case that they are getting closer together. We see that across a range of, of sectors, economic, political, security, um, and expect it to continue. I think there's a limit to which it will go, but, um, but nevertheless, that remains a concern. And in terms of the impact of the current crisis, I'd say that it, um, it's not yet clear to me exactly how it will affect the trajectory of their relationship. I think uh, it's clear that, that China has not come out and criticized Russia for their actions, clearly, and yet at the same time, 
They did abstain, for example, in the context of the UN Security Council resolution and in other uh, scenarios. And it does seem as if um, they are potentially paying a price for not criticizing Russia, and that may have an impact on how this trajectory moves forward. But I think, uh, in general, I think it does continue to the two countries get closer together. And others may have thoughts. All I would add, Congressman, is I think Director Coates was right. And I think, if anything, that relationship, the partnership between Russia and China has strengthened since 2019. I would add, though, that I, I, I think the President Xi and the Chinese leadership are a little bit unsettled by what they're seeing in Ukraine. They did not anticipate uh, the, the significant difficulties the Russians were going to run into. I think they're unsettled by the reputational damage that can come by their close association with President Putin, second by the economic consequences at a moment when, you know, they're facing lower annual growth rates than they've experienced for more than three decades. I think they're a little bit unsettled about the impact on the global economy. And third, I think they're a little bit unsettled by the way in which uh, Vladimir Putin has driven Europeans and Americans much closer together. I think they've, you know, valued their relationship with Europe um, and valued what they believe to be their capacity to try to drive wedges between us and the Europeans. And so I think that's unsettling for them as well. Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I'll address this to anybody on the panel that wants to answer the question or to discuss this, but China is investing billions of dollars, we know, in its domestic uh, semiconductor, semiconductor industry in an attempt to achieve full chip independence by 2050. I'm wondering what the assessment of the likelihood of China fully indigenizing its chip industry by then, what sort of security threats would you assess China's increased chip independence creates, and how can the U.S. and its allies address those threats moving forward? So, Congressman, this is a, a very timely question. and. Um, you know, as we look at China increasingly become more indigenous in their production, this has great concern for us. In terms of the, the broader impacts, I, I would like to talk about this a little bit more this afternoon because I, I can provide a, a depth I think that's uh, very important for us to cover. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you perceive a threat that the Chinese-made chips could also be exported abroad, or is this a topic that you just would rather discuss in a closed setting? If we can talk in close setting, that'd be great. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me shift gears then, and, and we'll, we'll revisit that topic in the closed setting. Um, General Barrier, some experts have voiced concerns that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could embolden the PRC to pursue a full-scale invasion or military blockade of Taiwan. What's your assessment of the likelihood of, of a copycat effect, and what more can the U.S. do to prevent the crisis in Ukraine from being repeated in Taiwan? Congressman, I think Taiwan and Ukraine are two different two different things completely. I also I also believe that our deterrence posture in the Pacific puts a very different perspective on, on all of this. I, we do know that that uh, the PRC watching very very carefully what happens and how this plays out uh, throughout the entire dime, uh, and and I would address more of this in the closed session. Okay. Um, is there any evidence that other adversaries are taking advantage of global uh, tension on Ukraine to undermine national security in the United States, such as possibly cyber threats? I'm sure that uh, there is a risk out there, and the gentleman to my right will, will no doubt want to answer that, but I, I have not seen specific intelligence that, that tells me that we are under a threat or attack right now. Okay. Congressman, uh, I'd concur in terms of not specifically tied to the Ukraine. We have obviously a, a high degree of vigilance right now just for a number of different threat streams that are out there, uh, but they're not necessarily only predicated on what we're seeing with the Ukraine. Okay. Um, let, me, let me shift gears um, over to Iran real quick in the, in the time that I have remaining. If the Iranian regime's leadership secures greater access to cash in the coming months and years, what concerns would you have with respect to Iran's capability to conduct terrorism, destabilize the Middle East, and threaten U.S. forces or our, our allies and partners? Congressman, I, I think the Iranians have done uh, remarkably well considering the resource constraints that they're under with uh, development of ballistic missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, and uh, destabilizing terrorist actions in the Middle East with the resources that they have. If they require more, if they get more funding, I think the threat becomes even worse. 
Does Iran continue to be the leading state sponsor of terrorism? And, and if so, do you believe it would be harmful to U.S. national security if terrorism sanctions designations against Iranian entities are lifted or weakened while such entities continue to engage in terrorism? I think that will be a decision for, for policymakers. We, we continue to see Iranian destabilizing actions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Stewart. I don't know if we'll have time to explore this. In fact, we won't. But there's this interesting dichotomy taking place in last year or so where you had China, who did very much the same thing to Hong Kong um, uh, that we saw happen in the Crimea and Donetsk in the eastern Ukraine, and now obviously with this full-scale invasion. Now, I understand I'm not equating the two. I understand there's a very different process that they went through. But I'm wondering if you assess that China watching this and the world's reaction to this, it would, seems to me it would give them extreme pause now when we consider their plans for Taiwan. I think the united response, you know, private companies pulling out, banking, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any analysis that would indicate that this is making China, China more reluctant than they would have been like six months ago? Yeah, I'm happy to start on that, and I suspect others will have views. But uh, but our analysts have been looking at this and, and quite agree with you, frankly. The, um, the view is both that it is likely to reinforce China's perspective on our, uh, um, the seriousness with which we would approach uh, an infringement on Taiwan, and, uh, and the unity that they've seen between Europe and the United States, particularly in enacting sanctions, and then not just that unity, but the impact of those sanctions, I think, are both things that are critical to their calculus and something that will be uh, interesting for us to see how they learn those lessons. No, I, I agree entirely. Now yield back. Thank you. Mr. Swalwell. What a difference a week and a half makes. Uh, I would describe Russia's actions and its consequences over the last week and a half as how to lose your status in 10 days. Uh, because of your work, uh, you have been the glue in the international community that has brought together not only NATO, uh, but other important countries to make sure that essentially, if you're a Russian, you are blocked from traveling, you can't use your Apple Pay, you can't stream your favorite video game, you cannot watch the latest Batman movie, you can't export your gas, you're isolated from the world. And I was hoping, uh, Director Haynes, you could just speak briefly to uh, what effect we are seeing uh, practically, economically, that the sanctions are already having, knowing that it's going to take a you know, protracted view as far as what the long-term consequences are. Yeah, you should have the Treasury Department, Commerce, and others before you on this question. But I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, the free fall that we've seen the ruble in has been extraordinary. And, uh, and one of the things, is, as Director Burns indicated, that's been very interesting about the way this has approached is that, you know, President Putin knew that sanctions were a likely result of an invasion of Ukraine, right, and uh, tried to prepare for it by creating essentially a national wealth fund that would give them the ability to defend their currency and manage some of the sanctions. And we've seen the Duma pass, for example, legislation that's intended to address some of the um, impact of sanctions, and yet the secondary actions that Europe has taken with the United States and that other partners around the world have done, I think really do mitigate essentially their ability to mitigate the impact that's having, that they're having on uh, Russian citizens right now and seeing the kind of impact that you think. Sure. I'd also say that the other factor that we didn't spend as much time analyzing but is clearly important is the commercial piece, the, the commercial decisions that are being made by multinational corporations to actually join in this, I think, is going to have a pretty significant impact on That's right. the economy. And, and Director uh, Burns, actually, um, look, there's probably a couple generations now who did not grow up um, spending their time under desks of a nuclear Soviet threat. And I would hope that we could unite in this country around the threat of Vladimir Putin. Um, that's not necessarily been the case. Uh, some people have cheered him on here in America. And I just want to go through this butcher of human rights who decapitates uh, any opposition he has. Was the Russian government responsible for the 2006 uh, poisoning and death of Alexander 
Litvenko, a former intelligence officer? Yes or no? Uh, yes, to the best of our knowledge. Who was the president at that time of Russia? Uh, Vladimir Putin. 2018, the Skripal family, were they victims of a Russian government poisoning? Yes. Who was the president of Russia at that time? Vladimir Putin. 2020, Alexei Navalny, opposition leader against the Russian government, uh, was he poisoned at the hands of the Russian government? Yes. Who was the president of Russia at that time? President Putin. Is the Rus Russian government responsible for the deaths of multiple journalists who have been critical of the Russian government? Uh, yes, sir. Has this included the reign of Vladimir Putin? Uh, certainly during the last 20 years, yes, sir. Outside of Russia, uh, he's also been a disruptor of democracy. Did Russia interfere in the 2016, 2018, and 2020 U.S. elections? Yes, sir. Did they interfere in the 2017 French election? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. Did they interfere in the 2017 German election? That I'll defer to my colleagues, I'm not certain. Is it assessed that Russia was responsible for the downing of a 2014 Malaysian airliner flight over Ukraine where 300 innocent souls were lost? I think that's the conclusion that many people have drawn, yes, sir. So would you describe Vladimir Putin as a savvy genius or a ruthless tyrant? I think ruthless tyrant comes much closer to the mark. Thank you, Director. Director Ray, what is your message to the business community knowing that uh, these ransomware attacks could be coming in your field office's ability to work with them and help them uh, if they are uh, a victim? Can you just update us on uh, just what your posture is right now and, and how they could reach out to you uh, if they are attacked? I appreciate the question. Our field offices are in a position uh, where they can have a technically trained agent at the doorstep of any company that's victimized within about an hour anywhere in the country. Uh, and time is of the essence because uh, that's what enables us. In some cases, you've seen us be able to claw back and recover the cryptocurrency that's paid in a ransom. It allows us to have a hot trail as investigators to be able to take uh, action to disrupt the ransomware actors. So in order to be able to protect the companies, uh, if they reach out, we can, again, we can out in the field, we can have somebody there to help uh, within about an hour. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Representative Stefanik. FBI Director Ray, on October 6, 2018, the families and close-knit community of Schoharie County in rural upstate New York experienced the deadliest transportation disaster in the U.S. in almost a decade when an illegal extended limo that shouldn't have even been on the road crashed and instantaneously killed 20 people. Are you aware of this? I know you have deep ties to upstate New York. I'm very generally aware of it, uh, partly partly because of my ties to upstate New York. I'm asking about this at today's Worldwide Threats Briefing because the owner of the limo company, Shahed Hussein, was a longtime informant of the FBI for prominent anti-terrorism cases in the war on terror, who testified publicly in numerous high-profile federal cases. And it is our job in Congress to conduct proper oversight of the FBI's activities, including the proper and improper use and handling of informants when it comes to addressing worldwide threats. This FBI informant had multiple run-ins with the law and various state and federal We're agencies. away from this hearing to go live to President Biden. We'll fill you in on what you've missed later on. Here's President Biden at the White House. ...ports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. This is a move that has strong bipartisan support in the Congress and, I believe, in the country. Americans have rallied support, have rallied to support the Ukrainian people and made it clear we will not be part of subsidizing Putin's war. This made, we made this decision in close consultation with our allies and our partners around the world, particularly in Europe, because a united response to Putin's aggression has been my overriding focus to keep all NATO and all of the EU and our allies totally united. We're moving forward with this ban, understanding that many of our European allies and partners may not be in a position to join us. The United States produces far more oil domestically than all of European all the European countries combined. In fact, we're a net exporter of energy. 
so we can take this step when others cannot. But we're working closely with Europe and our partners to develop a long-term strategy to reduce their dependence on Russian energy as well. Our teams are actively discussing how to make this happen, and today we remain united. We remain united in our purpose to keep pressure mounting on Putin and his war machine. This is a step that we're taking to inflict further pain on Putin, but there will be cost as well here in the United States. I said I would level with the American people from the beginning. And when I first spoke to this, I said defending freedom is going to cost. It's going to cost us as well in the United States. Republicans and Democrats understand alike understand that. Republicans and Democrats alike have been clear that we must do this. Over the last week, I've spoken with President Zelensky several times to hear from him about the situation on the ground and to consult and continue to consult with uh, our European allies and about U.S. support for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thus far, we've provided more than $1 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. Shipments of defensive weapons are arriving in Ukraine every day from the United States, and we, the United States, are the ones coordinating the delivery of our allies and partners of similar uh, weapons, from Germany to Finland to the Netherlands. We're, we're, we're working that out. We're also providing humanitarian support for the Ukrainian people, both those still in Ukraine and those who have fled safely to a neighboring country. We're working with humanitarian organizations to surge tens of thousands of tons of food, water, and medical supplies into Ukraine, and with more on the way. Over the weekend, I sent Secretary Blinken to visit uh, our border between — the border between Poland and Ukraine, and to Moldova to see what the situation was firsthand and report back. General Milley, chairman of the Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff of our Defense Department, is also what was also in Europe, meeting with his counterparts and allies on NATO's eastern flank to reassure them, those countries bordering Russia, NATO countries, that we will keep our NATO commitment, the sacred commitment of Article, of Article 5. The Vice President Harris is going to be traveling to meet with the, our allies in Poland and Romania later this week as well. I've made it clear that the United States will share in the responsibility of caring for the refugees so the costs do not fall entirely on the European countries bordering Ukraine. And yesterday, I spoke with my counterparts in France, Germany, and the United Kingdom about Russia's escalating violence against Ukraine and the steps that we're going to take, together with our allies and partners around the world, to respond to this aggression. We are enforcing the most significant package of economic sanctions in history, and it's causing significant damage to Russia's economy. It has caused Russian economy to fight, frankly, crater. The Russian ruble is now down to 50 percent, by 50 percent since Putin's announced his war. One ruble is now worth less than one American penny. One ruble is less than one American penny. And preventing Russia's central bank from propping up the ruble and to keep its value up. They're not going to be able to do that now. We cut the Russians' largest banks from the international financial system, and it has crippled their ability to do business with the rest of the world. In addition, we're choking off Russia's access to technology, like semiconductors that are — and uh, — and sap its uh, — its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Major companies are pulling out of Russia entirely without even being asked, not by us. Over the weekend, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, they all suspended their services in Russia, all of them, joining a growing list of American and global companies from Ford to Nike to Apple. They've suspended their operations in Russia. The U.S. stock exchange has halted trading of many Russian securities. And the private sector is united against Russia's vicious war of choice. The U.S. Department of Justice has assembled a dedicated task force to go after Russian — the crimes of Russian oligarchs. And we're joining with our European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets, and all their ill-begotten gains to make sure that they share in the pain of Putin's war. These, by the way, are giant yachts. You've put some of them in your press. I mean, some of them are — I think I've read one was over 400 feet long. I mean. It's uh, — this is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The decision today is not without cost here at home. Putin's war is already hurting American families at the gas pump. Since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then, 
the price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going to go up further. I'm going to do everything I can to minimize Putin's price hike here at home. In coordination with our partners, we've already announced that we're releasing 60 million barrels of oil from our joint oil reserves. Half of that, 30 billion, million, excuse me, is coming from the United States. And we're taking steps to ensure the reliable supply of global energy. We're also going to keep working with every tool at our disposal to protect American families and businesses. Now, let, me, let me say this. To the oil and gas companies and to the finance firms that back them, we understand Putin's war against the people of Ukraine is causing prices to rise. We get that. That's self-evident. But, 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 it's no excuse to exercise excessive price increases or padding profits or any kind of effort to exploit this situation or, Amer or American uh, consumers. Exploit them. Russia's aggression is costing us all, and it's no time for profiteering or price gouging. I want to be clear about what we'll not tolerate, but I also want to acknowledge those firms and oil and gas industries that are pulling out of Russia and joining other businesses that are leading by example. This is a time when we have to do our part and make sure we're not taking, we're not taking advantage. Look, let me be clear about uh, two other points. First. It's simply not true that my administration or policies are holding back domestic energy production. That's simply not true. Even amid the pandemic, companies in the United States pumped more oil during my first year in office than they did during my predecessor's first year. We're approaching a record levels of oil and gas production in the United States, and we're on track to set a record oil production next year. In the United States, 90 percent of onshore oil production takes place on land that isn't owned by the federal government. And of the remaining 10 percent that occurs on federal land, the oil and gas industry has millions of acres leased. They have 9,000 permits to drill now. They could be drilling right now, yesterday, last week, last year. They have 9,000 to drill onshore that are already approved. So let me be clear. Let me be clear. They are not using them for production now. That's their decision. These are the facts. We should be honest about the facts. Second, this crisis is a stark reminder. To protect our economy over the long term, we need to become energy independent. I've had numerous conversations over the last three months with our European friends of how they have to be wean themselves off of Russian oil. It's just not, it's just not tenable. It should motivate us to accelerate the transition to clean energy. This is a perspective that our European allies share and the future where, together, we can achieve greater independence. Loosening environmental regulations or pulling back clean energy investment won't, let me explain, won't, will not lower energy prices for families. But transforming our economy to run on electric vehicles powered by clean energy with tax credits to help American families winterize their homes and use less energy, that will, that will help. And if we can, if we do what we can, it will mean that no one has to worry about the price of the gas pump in the future. That'll mean tyrants like Putin won't be able to use fossil fuels as weapons against other nations. And it will make America a world leader, manufacturing and exporting clean energy technologies of the future to countries all around the world. This is the goal we should be racing toward. Over the last two weeks, Ukrainian people have inspired the world. And I mean that in a literal sense. They've inspired the world with their bravery, their patriotism, their defiant determination to live free. Putin's war, Putin's war has caused enormous suffering and needless loss of life of women, children, everyone in Ukraine. Both Ukraine and, I might add, Russians. Ukrainian leaders, as well as leaders around the world, have repeatedly called for a ceasefire, for humanitarian relief for real diplomacy. But Putin seems determined to continue on his murderous path, no matter the cost. Putin's now targeting cities and has been targeting cities and civilians, schools, hospitals, apartment buildings. Last week, he attacked the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, with an apparent disregard for the potential of triggering a nuclear meltdown. He has already turned two million Ukrainians into refugees. Russia may continue to grind out its advance at a horrible price, but this much is already clear. 
Ukraine will never be a victory for Putin. Putin may be able to take a city, but he'll never be able to hold the country. And if we do not respond to Putin's assault on global peace and stability today, the cost of freedom and to the American people will be even greater tomorrow. So we're going to continue to support the brave Ukrainian people as they fight for their country. And I call on Congress to pass the $12 billion Ukraine assistance package that I have asked them for uh, of late. The Ukrainian people are demonstrating by their physical courage that they are not about to just let Putin take what he wants. That's clear. They'll defend their freedom, their democracy, their lives. And we're going to keep providing security assistance, economic assistance, and humanitarian assistance. We're going to support them against tyranny, oppression, violent acts of subjugation. People everywhere, and I, I think it's maybe even surprised some of you all, people everywhere are speaking up for freedom. And when the history of this war is written, Putin's war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. May God bless all those heroes in Ukraine. And now I'm off to Texas. Thank you very, very much. I know there's a lot of I, I know. I know there's a lot of questions, but there's a lot more that has to be made clear, and I'm going to hold on that until we get more information. Thank you. Right. Appreciate it. Okay. President Biden announcing a ban on imports of Russian oil, saying it will not be acceptable to come to U.S. ports. He says this is designed to inflict pain on Russian leader Vladimir Putin. But President Biden acknowledged there will be costs here in the United States. This is live coverage from The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. We've been covering President Biden's remarks as well as the House Intel Committee. And shortly, we expect Ukrainian President, President Volodymyr Zelensky to address British Parliament. That's around noon Eastern time, so we will bring that to you live. I want to connect with James Homan briefly to recap what President Biden just laid out. You know, uh, President Biden trying to give some heartening words uh, uh, for the Ukrainian people. Um, you know, he did talk about the pain felt here in the United States because of oil prices, but James, he was careful to call it, you know, Putin's fault, really. Putin's price hike was the term that he used, which was pretty striking, Libby. And what was really startling uh, about that speech was hearing the president who ran on uh, tackling climate change boast that there was more domestic oil production in the first year of his term than in the first year of Donald Trump's term, uh, noting that there are more than 9,000 permits that have already been approved for onshore drilling. Uh, really a, a, a kind of a defensive posture saying it's not his fault that uh, oil companies aren't drilling more uh, and, it, and really making a defense that a lot of people wanted to hear from him last week during the State of the Union, uh, which is that it's not his fault that gas prices are going as high as they are. Uh, a lot of Democrats quite worried about the politics of that. And, uh, and, and the, the president more forceful there than we've heard him in some days. Yeah, James, uh, there is a calculation the White House has to make about how impactful this will be uh, to Russia, uh, but also how much they can rally the American people to sort of make that patriotic sacrifice. Yeah, and, and the president saying, you know, look, I'm in a level with you. Uh, this isn't necessarily going to uh, stop the invasion. There are going to be tough days ahead. Prices are going to go up even more than they are right now. Uh, but that he is uh, that these are costs we should be willing to pay for freedom, and uh, and it 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 really is pretty striking when you compare that hearing we just uh, are still watching where the the CIA director and the director of national intelligence said Putin anticipated some sanctions, but he miscalculated because he did not anticipate the will of the American government and the American people to make these kinds of sacrifices. He didn't think Russia was going to get cut out of the swift banking system, which it has. He didn't anticipate all these American companies uh, would pull out. And he certainly didn't anticipate that the U.S. would ban Russian oil. That said, as the president explained, Europe is not able uh, to ban Russian imports of oil. So Putin still uh, has some lifeline there. Uh, you know, James, we're going to go back to this hearing in just a moment, but this is not a hearing to listen to if you are feeling some anxiety about the state of the world. Uh, there are a lot of weighty issues on the table here, but we are getting some information, including an estimate on how many Russian soldiers have been killed so far. 
the, we heard from the, the head of the, the general in charge of the Defense Intelligence Agency that somewhere between 2,000 and 5,000 Russian troops have likely been killed in the first 13 days of this invasion. Uh, there are some unconfirmed reports about a general uh, who was killed. This has been a, a much bloodier war than Putin expected. It doesn't mean he's not ultimately going to take control of the country, but as we just heard from President Biden, Libby, he can take over a city, Putin. Uh, he can't necessarily occupy this country long term. Uh, and we've heard from these intelligence leaders that they are confident there will be a continuing and uh, very lethal insurgency against Russia uh, assuming Putin is able to get control of the country. All right, James Homan staying with me for the duration of the day. Let's bring in White House economics reporter Jeff Stein, who's been following the developments on sanctions as well as other penalties closely. First, I just want to point out, Jeff, that, that before we talk about President Biden, in this intel hearing, we're getting a, a description, a portrait painted of Russians who are really left without their usual routines, everything from uh, being able to get money out of the bank to just being able to watch the videos they watch and use the toys they like to to play with because of decisions made not just by other governments but my but by international companies talk to us about that unified effort yeah I think um, a lot of Americans don't quite realize obviously we all know that we have you know tremendously powerful military and um, nuclear weapons and this uh, incredible uh, armed services um, with with unbelievable power but the economic uh, power wielded by the United States to really, um, at the drop of a hat, cripple the economy of essentially almost any country we want to um, is something that I think m many Americans aren't quite aware of. And we've really seen it. Um, in, in just a week, we have brought the Russian economy um, to its knees. Um, the U.S. has imposed um, unprecedented sanctions on the Russian central bank, which has prevented it from foreign exchange measures that they need to prop up the ruble, uh, its currency, uh, in this time of instability. And as you mentioned, we've also, you know, the U.S. has also implemented um, severe sanctions on roughly um, a couple dozen Russian oligarchs close to Vladimir Putin. The U.S. is working now to seize the worldwide assets of some of the, the, these Russian billionaires' financial elite. There are other measures, the biggest of which we've just gotten announced today by the administration, uh, maybe the biggest, to cut um, energy exports from, from Russia to the U.S. The EU announced a much more moderate version of it. And, and these measures collectively, with really stunning speed, have made life uh, absolutely miserable for everyday Russians, uh, whether they wanted a part of this war or not. So, Jeff, talk to us about the actual impact of this announcement by President Biden today that the U.S. will will no longer import Russian oil. Well, on its own, the U.S. action is not that significant. Um, the U.S. only relies on um, Russian uh, exports for about 3 percent of its oil needs. That's really not that much and can be made up quite quickly. The, the key is that the U.S. has done this in coordination um, with its European allies. The U EU announced a plan today that, in theory, we'll, we'll have to get through sort of the fine details, uh, and, and I'm starting to look through that now. But in theory, it looks like that could cut EU um, imports of Russian energy by two-thirds. And combined, this is um, cutting off one of the most important sources of energy for the global economy. And obviously, without energy, the economy comes to a standstill. I've spoken to a number of economists who think that this could you know, put the whole global economy in a recession, which um, after you know several years of COVID would be an absolute nightmare. So what is going to happen exactly here? The U.S. is talking a lot about releasing um, its, its reserves of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The other European allies are working on, on similar measures in Japan and other countries. We're going to see the White House try to buffer the impact of a sudden, very sudden collapse in, in Russia, which currently uh, produces about 10 to 11 percent of the nation of the world's oil um, and, and, you know, you know, 5 percent of um, uh, or 5 million uh, bar barrels of oil uh, it exports a day. So that, that's a huge impact, and we could see prices really skyrocket quite quickly.
All right, Jeff Stein, thank you so much. Thanks for hustling over to talk with us, and I look forward to uh, reading more of your reporting as you piece apart exactly what this all means. Thank you. Well, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will soon be addressing the Brit British Parliament. Rather, that will be by video. We plan to bring that to you live in about 15 minutes' time. For now, though, let's return to the House Intelligence Committee hearing. These are U.S. intelligence leaders testifying on worldwide threats, including Russia. Yes, yeah, same. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you all again for your extraordinary work. It's been remarkable. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. And Director Burns, I first want to just thank you for your assessment of Vladimir Putin. It was very insightful, and I think it's helpful to us to understand his decision-making process, and I just want to thank you for that. I think you put more clarity on that than anyone I've ever talked to. Uh, for all the witnesses, it's been reported open source that a Saudi detainee at Guantanamo Bay, Mohammed Mani Ahmad al Qatani, who attempted to take part in the 9-11 hijacking plot but later was detained and captured in Afghanistan, is being released from Gitmo into Saudi custody. Can you tell this committee why this individual is being released now and whether or not his release is part of a broader arrangement with Saudi Arabia? Because I also note uh, that I think President Biden is on his way to Saudi Arabia uh, in the near future. Thank you, sir. I'll start. Uh, as a general matter, um, as you know, it's been the policy of the administration uh, several prior to continue to move forward on um, Guantanamo uh, detainees to review them and then determine if they should be transferred or, um, or otherwise. And uh, I understand it to be part of a broader um, trend, essentially, of, of a number of detainees that have been transferred to Saudi Arabia. I don't think it's a new arrangement, at least that I'm aware of. But. Okay. I, and, and I know that's kind of a quick one and sprung on you, so uh, if, if we can follow up on that, I would appreciate it. And I want to get just a little bit, I want to thank all of the IC, and that's every single one of you guys up here for the exquisite intelligence and the and that you provided to Ukraine and everyone. Uh, once again, you guys all, uh, you made America proud, and across the world, people appreciate the work you've done. Now, General Nakasone, I always get to pick on you. I'm sorry, because I'm a Hask. I'm a Title 50 and a Time. 10 guy. And so I want to ask a few questions. Um, Republicans have been requesting specific data points for nearly a year on the consequences of the dual hat relationship between U.S. Cybercom and NSA. And I'm hoping you can provide some clarity today. And I think that's important because uh, the way I see this, and it's very hard for me to distinguish between Title 10 and Title 50, it's taken me a while to get a grasp on both of those. Uh, generally, DOD is a little more offensively uh, oriented and Title 50 is a little more defensive and intelligence related. So my first question, are the operational requirements of the two organizations in decline, relatively flat, or are they growing? They continue to grow, Congressman. And have dependencies between the two agencies, such as shared infrastructure and capabilities, increased or decreased during the past several years? They've decreased. And have you taken any action to decrease any such dependencies? I have not. Uh, in terms of, and I think this is really designed for the infrastructures that we operate off of, uh, those were decisions prior to mine. I think they were good decisions, and uh, we've carried out, you know, separate infrastructures that have been developed for both uh, U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. And how many meetings did you hold last year related to your role as commander of U.S. Cybercom? Congressman, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I hold a lot of meetings every single day. Can you follow up with specifics of how many in that role you did uh, in, to, to this committee in writing? Certainly, and I... I and, and how many, and joint question with that, how many do you owe as director of NSA? So just the number of meetings that you held in each capacity. Uh, have you taken any action to meet the requirements of Section 1642 of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017 to establish certification requirements for the termination of the dual hat row? So, Congressman, on those uh, conditions, we've continued to operate towards them. Uh, we, we uh, you know, we've done the things that, uh, that we've outlined to make sure that those get done. Uh, as you probably will recall, that was uh, a part of the NDA that was put in there, not necessarily as a precursor to terminate the du dual hat, any kind of a decision like that, but it was intended if there was a decision that these had to be made. 
And, and I want to be really clear because sometimes it seems like I'm picking on you. Uh, I think you do an exceptional job in both roles. So my issue is not with you personally, but I do have to uh, look at who follows and those things that follow and to make sure that we're in the right transition form that when it follows you that we have the right organization and structure and command style that we that we can still focus because everybody's not going to be just like you uh, and so we have to we have to prepare for the the army standard so to speak congressman i appreciate that and i appreciate your questions today um let me just just say a few things on that um this is a role that can be done by anyone that you know, is obviously had the experience and the, and the training and the, the, it's not unique to me running both organizations. What is unique is that the domain of what we're operating here in cyberspace is requiring the speed and the agility and a unity of effort that the nation needs. And we're seeing that with what we've seen in elections, what we've seen with ransomware, and now what we're seeing with Ukraine and, and Russia. This is, this is the advantage of being able to have one person that, that runs both organizations, in my opinion. And, and final comment before I yield back. I just think that uh, that dual hat may help to be more offensively capable in cyber realm as opposed to defensive. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Christian Murthy. Thank you again for your outstanding service to our country. We are so honored. Uh, Director Burns, a lot of my constituents think that Putin is crazy or he's playing crazy. Uh, in an open setting, how do you assess Putin's mental state? Um, I think his, his views, Congressman, on Ukraine and a lot of other issues have hardened over the years. I think he's far more insulated from other points of view and people who would challenge or question his, his views. In, in my opinion, that doesn't make him crazy, but it makes him extremely difficult to deal with because of the hardening of his views over time and the it, narrowing of his inner circle. It seems like you... you you characterize him as stewing in grievance and ambition, but he's also tempered by um, the fear of popular unrest. How do we assess in the last 12 days or two weeks uh, his popular support in Russia? Well, I mean, I think this is, this is something we're going to keep a very careful eye on over time. Um, you know, in an environment in which the Russian state media dominates what a lot of people hear, about what's going on in Ukraine. It's going to take time, I think, for people to absorb the consequences of the choices that he's made personally. Um, but you do, we, do we see, do we see uh, increasing reports in social media in Russia about the deaths and the KIAs and the casualties? Uh, because obviously, they're probably going to hear from the front lines through some means you, about the status of their relatives, correct? You, you do see some of that already. You see funerals in Russia of, you know, young Russian soldiers who were killed in Ukraine coming home, and that clearly is going to have an impact over time. You also see, in relatively small numbers, but a lot of very courageous Russians out on the street protesting, and something like 13 or 14,000 have been arrested since then, which is not a small thing in a deeply repressive society like Russia. Um, Lieutenant General Barrier, um, I and several members of, the, of this community committee have introduced legislation called the Support Act. It's a bipartisan act to basically put in law our support uh, for Ukraine. And if the Russians eventually overrun the government, which we hope and pray and we are going to do everything we can to prevent, um, an insurgency is likely to develop. Um, I guess one of the questions that we would ask is, have you commissioned a reporter? Is there an organized effort to assess what we would need to do to support such an insurgency? I think the, uh, the entire IC is looking at that issue right now, and I think it would be good for a discussion uh, in a closed session. Um, let me ask you this question. Uh, with regard to Kyiv, uh, the Russians appear to be attempting to cut off food and water uh, to the city, how much food and water, or how many days or weeks of food and water do the people of Kiev have at this point? I don't, I don't have a specific number for days of supply that the population has, uh, but with, with supplies being cut off, um, it will become uh, somewhat desperate in, in, I would say, 10 days to two weeks. Wow. Uh, Director Haynes, uh, what can Taiwan the government of Taiwan learn from the Ukrainian government right now about how to uh, prepare and stave off an invasion of Taiwan? 
That's a great question. I, um, I should give that some consideration. <laughs> Let me come back to you on that. That's I would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you know, the Chinese government must have misjudged our resolve and our collective ability to inflict economic harm on those who would uh, engage in malign aggression. Uh, Director Burns, do you think there's any opening whatsoever uh, for us and the Chinese to have a more productive conversation about Taiwan uh, or their malign intentions, given that they may have thrown in their lot with the wrong horse, uh, the Russians at this point? Well, Congressman, I, I would just say analytically, I would not underestimate uh, President Xi and the Chinese leadership's determination with regard to Taiwan. I do think, as Director Haynes said earlier, they've been surprised and unsettled to some extent by what they've seen in Ukraine over the last 12 days. Everything from the strength of the Western reaction to the way in which Ukrainians have fiercely resisted to the relatively poor... But you don't see an Russia opening right to, now for... In Taiwan? Yeah. No, I mean, I think there's an impact on, on the Chinese calculus with regard to Taiwan, which we obviously are going to continue to pay careful attention to. Last question. Uh, the president appears to be uh, considering banning the import of oil from Russia. What impact do we assess that would have on the Russian economy, Director Haynes? Um. I'm trying to think, so it's roughly 8%, I believe, of our crude oil imports overall. And for them, I believe it's a relatively small amount on theirs, but I think it will have some impact on them. And certainly symbolically, it's an important move if that's something that's done. I'll give you a more detailed answer if we can on the impact on the economy. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, just to, for the committee's benefit, since we've been in the hearing for some time, the president uh, announced a ban on Russian oil uh, while we were in the hearing. Um, Mr. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> he was listening to, uh, to Mr. Krishnamurthy. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Fitzpatrick. Hey, Mr. Chairman, uh, first to the intelligence committee uh, community. Um, you were spot on in your intelligence. Your decision to declassify both the form and the fashion in which you did so saved lives. Uh, sleep well, and thank you for doing that. Uh, I'm going to pose a question, which I think the answer is more suitable for the close segment, uh, but I'm going to ask it here. We all have different roles to play. You are all investigators, intelligence gatherers, reporters, we're legislators, but I think it's still important that we analyze this question. Um, I was on the Ukraine-Poland uh, border. We just got back yesterday. Uh, on the Ukrainian side, the um, Ukrainian men were bringing their wives and their children. Um, saying goodbye potentially for the last time. There were 100,000 just in one day when we were there. That was a record. The record was broken the following day. Uh, there's about 10 to 12 million Ukrainian men, age 18 to 60, who are not allowed to leave the country. They don't want to leave the country. They want to fight. Um, and they could potentially be slaughtered in mass form. Uh, we, uh, Vladimir Putin could be creating an entire generation of widows and orphans. And this decision not to intervene is largely based on uh, Ukraine's non-NATO status. Uh, Finland's not a NATO member. Uh, they have roughly 5 million people. Austria, 9 million people. Sweden, 10 million. Switzerland, 8 million. None of them are NATO members. And I think what the American people have a hard time wrapping their brain around is how is it okay, granted we applied sanctions, granted we're providing defensive support, but to not intervene, to the tune of potentially hundreds of thousands, of millions of lives lost, and yet if one step is taken over the remaining border and one remaining life is taken, the full force of the military of 30 nations will come and intervene. I think everybody's struggling with that, particularly because we've had many, many non-NATO interventions in the past, Kosovo, Bosnia, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Cameroon, Yemen, Korea, Syria, Kuwait, just to name a few. But the one difference is the nuclear capability. So. What we're getting asked a lot is, are we basically creating an incentive for a nuclear proliferation? Because the message we're being, that we're sending is if you have nuclear weapons and you're crazy, we're gonna stand back on military intervention. I think we just need to wrap our brains around that because a lot of people are really struggling. Uh, and when you have Vladimir Putin bombing a children's cancer hospital, willing to go that length to cross those Rubicons, we have a program here in the United States, Make-A-Wish Foundation, that gives children dying of cancer their final wish to brighten their day at the end. These children in Ukraine, who 
who are suffering from pediatric cancer, they're spending their final days having bombs dropped on their head. So I'd like to explore that when we get in the classified session because you're not policymakers, we get that, but we all have a collective role to play. Uh, my question for Director Ray, um, there's legislation making its way through the Senate right now. If you could just uh, discuss, sir, the importance uh, to have cyber reporting incidents directly uh, to the FBI and not just as a pass-through, and also discuss liability protections for companies uh, that do report to the FBI. So no one believes more in the importance of private sector uh, reporting of cyber threat information than I do, uh, and I've been testifying and calling for it you know, for quite some time. It's important, though, that that information flow. We're breaking away from the hearing to go live now to the British House of Commons. Ukrainian President Zelensky is about to address the British Parliament. That will be via video. We'll watch the feed now. It will be translated. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Um, um, all, all the members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, I'm addressing all the people of the United Kingdom and all the people from the country with a big history. I'm addressing you as a citizen, as a president of also a big country with a dream and big effort. I would like to tell you about the three days of about the 13 days of war, the war that we didn't start and we didn't want it. However, we have to conduct this war. We do not want to lose what we have, what is ours, our country, Ukraine, just the same way as you once didn't want to lose your country when Nazis started to fight your country. And you had to fight for Britain. 13 days of the struggle on day one, at four o'clock in the morning, we were attacked by cruise missiles. Everybody woke up, uh, people, children, the entire Ukraine, and since that, we have not been sleeping. We have all been fighting uh, for our country with our army. On day Two, we have been fighting airstrikes, and our heroic um, military servicemen on the island Zmini have been trying to fight. When Russian flag, uh, demand, when Russian forces demanded that we lay down the arms, however, we did continue fighting and. Uh, and we did, we did fill our force, um, the force of our people that will uh, oppose their occupants unti until the end. The next day, the artillery, artillery started fighting us. The, the, our army showed us who we are and uh, we, we have been able to see who are people and who are beasts. Now, on day four, we started uh, getting people captive. We have not been torturing them. We remained humane even on day four of this terrible war. On day five, the terror against us was going on against children, against cities, and constant shelling have been taking place uh, around the country, including hospitals, and that didn't break us. And that gave us feeling of big truth on day six. 
the Russian um, rockets uh, fell on Babin Yar, that is the place where the Nazis killed uh, thousands of people during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, 80 years after, the Russia hit at them for the second time. And even um, churches are getting destroyed uh, by shelling. On day eight, we have seen Russian tanks uh, hitting uh, the atomic power station. And everybody got to understand that this is the terror against everyone. On day nine, there was a meeting of NATO countries without the um, result that we were looking for. Yes, we did feel that. We did feel that um, we did feel that, unfortunately, that the alliances don't work properly always, and the no-fly zone cannot be enforced. And on day 10, the Ukrainians started protesting and mass stopping the um, armored vehicles with their own hands. And on day 11, the children and cities were being hit, and hospitals as well, with the rockets and uh, constant shelling. And on that day, we realized that your Ukrainians became heroes. The entire cities, children, adults. And on day 12, the losses of Russian army exceeded 10,000 people killed and also including the general, and that gave us hope that there will be some kind of uh, responsibility for those people of, uh, in front of the court. On day 13, in, in the city of Mariupol that was attacked by the Russian force, a child was killed. They do not allow any food, any water, and people started panicking. I, I think everybody can hear that that people do not have water over there. Over 13 days of this um, situation, over 50 children have been killed. These are the children that could have lived, but these people have taken them away from us. The United Kingdom, Ukraine, were not looking to have this fall. The Ukraine have not been looking to become uh, big, but they have become big over the days um, of this war. The, we are the country that are saving people despite um, um, despite having to fight the one of the biggest uh, country, one of the biggest armies in the world, we have to fight the helicopters, rockets. Uh, the question for us now is to be or not to be. You all know this Shakespearean question. For 13 days, this question. Uh, could have been asked, but now I can give you a definitive answer. It's definitely yes to be. Um, and I would like to remind you the words that the United Kingdom have already heard, and which are important again. We will not give up and we will not lose. We will fight till the end at sea, in the air. We will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. We will fight in the forests, in the fields, on the shores, in the streets. I would like to add that we will fight uh, on, the, on the banks of different rivers like Dnieper, and we, will, we are looking uh, for your help for the help of the civilized countries. 
we are, we are thankful for this help. And we and I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Boris. Please increase the pressure of sanctions against this uh, country. And please recognize this country a, as a terrorist state. And please make sure that our Ukrainian skies are safe. Please make sure that you do what needs to be done and what is stipulated by the greatness of your country. Best of all to Ukraine and uh, to the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the House of Commons, I want, I want to thank you for speaking to us and for giving us very clearly the and British powerful Parliament perspective. Giving Ukrainian the President Volodymyr Zelensky a standing ovation. Of course, Prime Minister Boris Johnson in there as well. Uh, we are going to talk to James Homan for a moment to recap what we just heard and the importance of it. And then we'll head back to the Intel Committee hearing as they prepare to wrap up before they go into closed session. So, James, we heard the Ukrainian President uh, really having the rhythm and, and patter at one point of Winston Churchill as he talked about how the Ukrainians would fight. Libby, it was a Churchillian speech, and indeed, I'm not sure the translator realized it, but Zelensky was directly quoting the Churchill speech delivered where Boris Johnson was sitting uh, in that chamber during the Battle of Britain, saying, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the forests, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, uh, and making it explicit that this is uh, likening this struggle to protect Ukraine to the Britain to the British struggle to, uh, to save the UK from Nazism. Uh, Zelensky also quoting another Brit, William Shakespeare, saying the question for the last two weeks has been to be or not to be, and then answering it's definitely yes to be, saying that Ukraine will continue to be a force, asking for British help, thanking the Brits and particularly the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, which today has uh, essentially followed the U.S. lead in announcing plans to scale back uh, using Russian oil, importing it uh, to UK territories. So a, a pretty remarkable show of solidarity. You saw long standing ovations on the front end and the back end from both sides of the aisle. All right, James Homan, thank you so much. We'll talk more about what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, as well as the potential impact of President Biden's announcement today that the U.S. will ban Russian oil imports. Let's first, though, go back to this House intel hearing and wrap things up as the final handful of members of this committee ask their questions in this open setting. Well, I think part of what you should, there are a number of mechanisms of oversight that exist on Section 702. Uh, and, of course, now we have a new one, namely this Office of Internal Audit. Uh, but in addition to that, you have the Justice Department's uh, National Security Division. Uh, you have the court's own review processes. Uh, and so my strong expectation is that all of these efforts that we've undertaken over the last 18 months or so uh, should dramatically reduce the rate of, uh, of compliance incidents. Uh, and I am assured by other stakeholders in the process that they too are optimistic, meaning outside the FBI, that they too are optimistic that these changes will have that effect. I take your point about our educating uh, both the committee and others about all these reforms, uh, and it's good advice, and we will look at how we can better engage with the committee to walk you through it. Of course, these are changes that take a little bit of time and effort to walk people through. They don't uh, unfortunately, lend themselves to uh, you know a short exchange in, in an open hearing, but but you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it's the burden is on us to to walk you all through it, uh, because you do understand just how important a tool this is. This is the tool that we use more and more these days to identify cyber victims and get out and warn them. This is the tool we use to go after foreign intelligence services, the MSS, 
uh, and the Russian intelligence services, the Iranians, and their increasingly brazen activity. This is the tool that we're going to need more and more, not less and less, over the next five years as the terrorist landscape with the withdrawal in Afghanistan, with the degeneration uh, in Ethiopia involving al-Shabaab. I could go on and on, but just about every threat that you've heard about, to the extent that it affects the homeland from overseas, 702 is going to be the tool that protects us. So we want to make sure that we give you all uh, and the rest of the Congress the information you need to get comfortable. Uh, but I, I cannot stress enough how important a tool it is and how committed my leadership team and I are to making sure that the reforms that we've put in place have the effect that you rightly expect from us. Thank you. Representative Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I share with all of my colleagues uh, really bipartisan support for the extraordinary leadership you've all shown, and I know you've been working long hours, and we're deeply grateful to you. Um, I I want to associate myself with Mr. Fitzpatrick's comments. I believe that the American people think we need to do more. And to call this unprovoked is, is actually um, modest. It is premeditated. It is savage. It is unconscionable brutality. And we're going to watch a genocide happen in Ukraine if we don't create our own red lines. So I guess um, I'd like to start with you, Director Burns, because you know Vladimir Putin better than probably anyone else in this room. Um, he's already said he has a red line, which is the economic sanctions. That, that, that was um, you know, the beginning of World War III. What, he, he clearly wants to recreate the Soviet Union and pick up all the, the Balkan states. Why are we somehow reluctant to recognize that he's willing to go as far as he needs to go. Well, Congresswoman, I think, you know, Putin's actions, especially in the last two weeks, and they have been premeditated and they have been savage, just as you described, I think should remove any doubt about, you know, the depth of his determination, not just with regard to Ukraine, but in terms of, you know, he, how he exercises Russian power. I would, however, say that what he's been met with since then, first and foremost by Ukrainians themselves and their courage and their heroism and the strength of their leadership, um, has surprised and unsettled him. I think he's been unsettled by the Western reaction and allied resolve, particularly some of the decisions the German government has taken. Um, I think he's been unsettled by the performance of his own military. I guess, excuse me for interrupting, sure. but do you, knowing as much as you know about him, He's not going to stop at Ukraine, correct? Well, I think that's what makes it um, more important than ever to demonstrate that he's not going to succeed in Ukraine. Um, and, and I think that's what the challenge is uh, for all of us, because what's at stake is more, as important as Ukraine's sovereignty is, what's at stake is more than that. It's about an a, a incredibly important uh, rule in international order. The big countries don't get to swallow up small countries just because they can. And I think this is one of those pivotal points where we and all of our allies and partners need to act on that. And okay. I think that's what we're doing. Thank you. Um, General Nakasone, they have not, Russia has not really engaged in a lot of cyber warfare to date in Ukraine. Um, can you indicate why not? based on your estimation? And should we be prepared in the United States for that to be one of his next actions against us? Congressman, let me start with the last part of your question, which is yes, definitely. We, we have to be prepared for the Russians and any other threat that would, uh, would try to put us at risk in cyberspace. In terms of uh, Russia, they have conducted several attacks in the Ukraine, uh, three or four upon which we've watched and, and uh, we've tracked very carefully. Uh, in terms of why they haven't done more, I, I think that that's obviously some of the work that the Ukrainians have done, some of the, the challenges that, that the Russians have uh, um, uh, encountered, and, and some of the work that, that others have been able to, to prevent uh, their actions. And so it has not been um, what, what we would anticipate when we were going into this several weeks ago. Um, I don't know if this should be to you, General Nakasone or, or General Barrier, but um, can we now say that uh, Putin has conducted himself in a manner that he has created war crimes? 
Do we have evidence? I'm sure General Barrier can answer that much more effectively. I, Representative, I don't know that we have direct evidence besides what we see on social media. Certainly the bombing of schools and, and facilities that are not associated with the Ukrainian, Ukrainian military would indicate to me that he's stepping up right to the line if, if he hasn't done so already. All right, thank you. Um, Director Ray, have we seized any U.S. real estate owned by oligarchs or their family members since the president created the task force? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I know that we have taken uh, right. law enforcement action under the task force that the president created uh, just as recently as a few days ago that involved criminal charges, and there may have been some seizures associated with that. I just apologize. I don't know off the Could top you of provide my head. that to the committee? I think the American people want to see action. And by the way, both New York City and Miami are um, the locus of many of the oligarchs' um, real estate ownings. Uh, General Barry, in my last 12 seconds, um, I will ask that you take this question for the record and provide me additional uh, information later. The Wall Street Journal just did an article that um, was deeply troubling to me and I think to my colleagues about a toxic environment in DIA. Uh, a whistleblower came forward. Um, there is egregious behavior going on. Um, and another time, I would like you to provide us additional information about what you're doing to change that. I yield back. Mr. Gallagher. Uh, Director Burns, uh, at the risk of stirring up unwanted nostalgia or adding uh, gray hair, um, I feel like you're in a unique position given your experience in Russia and negotiating with the Iranians to answer some of these questions. Is there any evidence that the Central Bank of Iran has stopped financing terrorism? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that, Congressman, as well. I just want to give you a, a well-informed answer. And happy to address that in classified session. I just would, I think, I think it's important perhaps for the president to understand to what extent they are prior to us deciding to lift sanctions on the Central Bank of Iran, and that's the intent of the question. So I look forward to following up on that. A related question, do you, do the Russians believe that they have leverage over us because of the ongoing negotiations over Iran's nuclear program in Vienna? Um, I don't think the Russians, uh, right now they're so preoccupied in Ukraine, I don't think they exaggerate the influence or the leverage that they have. I mean, you know, over the years, and we'll see what happens now, given the depth of, you know, division over Ukraine, but, you know, what's been remarkable over a number of years is the extent to which they've contributed to those negotiations. Now, it remains to be seen whether that's going to continue, but up until this point, that's been the case. So then do you view uh, what's the lead negotiator? Is it Ulyanov? Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing Ulyanov, that. Yeah. Bragging that he's swindled us in Vienna, is that just mere bluster? More to the point, Lavrov demanding that no sanctions with respect to Ukraine impede their ability to do business with Iran going forward. That, should we view that as bluster then? No, I take that seriously. I mean, it's, it's something we have to take seriously as well. And, and I don't think we can just assume that that's bluster. Um, but uh, so, no, that's something we can't minimize. Maybe to put it a little bit differently. Would it be, have the negotiations with Iran over their nuclear program been affected by any other issues, such as the sudden need to uh, backfill Russian oil supplies on the global market, or the remarkable fact that one of our P5 plus one partners has made the sudden decision to arm Ukraine? Have the negotiations been affected in any way by those developments? Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not involved directly in the negotiations, Congressman, but I don't think they have. I think this is being done on the merits uh, about, you know, whether it makes sense from the point of U.S. national interest to go back into the JCPOA, recognizing, as I said earlier, that we got lots of other problems posed by this Iranian regime, quite apart from the nuclear issue as well. And given that you've been one of the leading sort of envoys for this administration, is, is the plan, if there is a deal in Vienna, to bring that plan to the U.N. Security Council for some sort of vote? I, I honestly don't know, sir. You don't know? Okay. I think the concern, at least the concern I've heard from a lot of my constituents is that the president has gone out and made an, an explicit promise, one that I agree with, by the way, to turn Vladimir Putin into an international pariah 
But at the same time, if we have the State Department, who's not represented here today, saying we're going to continue to cooperate with Iran on the P5, I mean, with Russia on the P5 plus one negotiations over Iran's nuclear program, well, those two things don't necessarily add up. Now, I get diplomacy is complex. You've literally written the book on it, and you know we have to manage multiple crises, but. It seems obvious to me that the Russians are at least trying, in a public narrative, if nothing else, to connect the two issues, though you have just said that they remain unconnected, if that makes sense. Now, what I said, Congressman, is, is, you know, from the point of view, as I understand it, of our approach to the negotiations, they're not connected. We're doing this on the merits with regard to the Iranian nuclear issue. How the Russians try to play that question of leverage that you mentioned is a genuine concern. We have to pay careful attention to that. And then quickly, going to the question of the lessons that um, China might derive from the Ukraine crisis uh, with respect to Taiwan. You've both said that they, uh, or at least Director Burns, you said, I think Director Hanger said the same, that they are unsettled by what they've seen in Ukraine. And you laid out an argument for that. But is that, is your assessment that they're unsettled, is that based on any information we have? Or is that just based on your, your experts sort of projecting? Well, I mean, it's assessment based on how our experts see this, but I'd be glad in the other session to okay. talk a little bit more I about that. very much look forward to that. And then finally, uh, Director Haynes, the New York Times reported that over a three-month period, senior administration officials shared U.S. intelligence with the Chinese related to Russians, uh, Russia's troop buildup in Ukraine, and then the Chinese then shared that information with Moscow. Have we done a, a damage assessment uh, of, of our, our, our decision to share that intelligence with, with the Chinese? I don't know about the article that you're talking about. We shared, obviously, information with NATO and with our European allies and other partners around the world. Um, it, what we shared, to the extent we shared much with China, was not something we expected would not be handed over. Okay, perhaps we, we can follow up because I'm out of time, but are, so, you, so you dispute the New York Times article? I'm sorry, I just haven't read the New York Times article. I'm just answering the question as I understand you to okay. be it. So. I'll print it out and we can look Absolutely. at it in the classified. Representative Demings. I want to thank you all um, for what you do for us uh, every day. Um, I have to say thanks for being uh, the good guys because uh, we are pretty clear-eyed on who the bad guy uh, is, bad guys in today's world and in today's situations. Um, I just want to thank my colleague Eric Swalwell and for uh, Director Burns for just not letting us forget uh, just who and what are we are, are dealing with. Uh, um, Ms. Haynes, I'm going to, Director Haynes, I'm going to direct my questions to you or anyone else can answer them if they feel better suited. The Freedom House uh, 2022 report noted that the present threat to democracy is the product of 16 consecutive years of decline in global freedom. Does the IC uh, community believe that Putin's heinous assault on democracy empowers the people of the not free countries to challenge authoritarian leaders, or do you believe it empowers those leaders uh, to double down? So I think that, from our perspective, um, Putin's approach to cracking down, essentially, on dissent and on civil society in Russia certainly is looked upon by others who may wish to do the same as a kind of a model for how to do it in many respects. And so I think in that sense, uh, you know, it is likely that others learn from that. Um, I hope that the heroic resistance that we see in Ukraine and that our efforts to really expose President Putin for who he is and for the choices that he's made uh, help to promote um, and empower populations to speak up in dissent from such authoritarian efforts. But I, I make sure that mm -hmm. the question of others would like to add to this. Director Burns? Oh, I, I think I was someone, just as Director Haynes said, this depends on how this turns out. I mean, I think if, if um, Ukrainians demonstrate um, the hollowness of what Putin and Putinism represent, um, then I think it sends a very strong message. I think if the Western resolve that we've seen in response to this 
um, helps to demonstrate to people the resilience of democracies at a time when there's been lots of speculation about them not being so strong and not so resilient. I think that carries a message that goes even beyond you know, what's unfolding in Ukraine today. So that's really what's at stake. Thank you. Could you also do an assessment of the threat to democracy in Latin America, uh, for example, um, and the effectiveness of China and Russia to supplant the U.S. as the partner of choice to countries that have been uh, reliable allies? Yes, we can absolutely provide to you an assessment on that. Great. And does the IC um, observe the anti-democratic heads of state in Latin America amplifying Russia's malign influence messaging in the region designed to sow distrust uh, in the U.S.? Is that a part of their, their plan? I think, as your question indicates, um, many countries in Latin America, and as our assessment indicates, are essentially under pressure, economic pressure, political pressure, a variety of different forms of pressure, and as a consequence are being forced to make decisions about whether or not they accept what is frequently an open hand from Russia or China, but with a price tag, essentially, um, for a variety of different uh, projects that might be useful to those leaders in the context of their work, but nevertheless are expected to buy influence, in effect, within their countries. And so we do see that. Do you believe the use of surveillance technology is likely to increase in Latin America for the same purpose? I think the likelihood of surveillance technology to increase around the world is likely. I know, um, I believe you all spoke about this earlier. I'm sorry I was out of the room, but um, there was a question about foreign anti-democratic groups uh, collaborating uh, with extreme groups in the United States. If you could just touch a little bit more on that, or again for me, please. Who, Director Ray? Um, I, what I would say is we, we certainly have seen uh, foreign groups, sometimes um, non-state actors, but who uh, have relationships of their own with, with foreign governments, uh, seek to amplify discord and divisiveness here to, uh, to provide essentially gasoline on the fire of you know, various um, demonstrations and things of that sort, but then also uh, potentially to have that boil over into violence if, if necessary. And certainly we have also seen domestic violent extremists here in the U.S. seek to connect with like-minded groups overseas uh, through travel, in some cases training, et cetera. So that's another part of uh, another dimension of this. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I just have one follow-up question. Um, to what degree, Dr. Haynes or anyone, uh, are you concerned that the Russians may use cryptocurrency to evade sanctions? What capacity is there to do that? Yeah, we've seen, obviously, cryptocurrency is a concern in relation to trying to avoid sanctions. And I think there may be some of that. We should get you an assessment so that you get an educated perspective from the analyst. But I think... Uh, our assessment generally has been that it would be challenging for them to be effective at completely undermining the sanctions using cryptocurrency. Um, Mr. Turner, uh, thank you very much for your testimony today. And again, uh, I think the profound thanks of Congress, but, uh, but also the American people for the extraordinary work you do to keep us safe and uh, extraordinary degree of fidelity uh, you had in your uh, anticipation of Putin's moves. Um, let me just uh, reiterate our request with respect to uh, the 9-11 documents, which are being redacted and made public. Um, we still uh, have not been able to obtain the full unredacted documents, which we would like to see to be able to evaluate and make sure that the Redactions are, are properly based, so we would uh, like to reiterate our request to see the full unredacted 9-11 documents as well as uh, the justification for any redactions. Um, with that, I thank you, and we will see you in closed session shortly. We are adjourned.
This is live coverage from the Washington Post. That wraps up the public phase of this House Intel Committee's time with the country's top intelligence leaders. They go behind closed doors this afternoon to discuss classified matters, and we will see those same witnesses testify before the Senate on Thursday. Well, much of the focus in today's hearing was Russia and the danger it poses globally and most pressing to Ukraine. So let's go now to a Washington Post video journalist who has been reporting in Ukraine. She was there for weeks leading up to Russia's attack and has continued filing stories about what's happening. Whitney Shefty joins us now from Kyiv. Whitney, tell us about what's happening in Kyiv right now. Does it feel like a city under threat and under siege? Kyiv certainly does feel that way in, in some regards. I mean, it, it has become fortified in a lot of ways. There are checkpoints everywhere you go now, um, you know, concrete blocks that have been stacked up all across different parts of the city, spikes in the road, um, tires that have been stacked filled with books um, to prevent people from, from going through easily, um, and lots of what they call territorial defense members who are there to, to check people through. Um, the city itself ha has stayed fairly protected, but there, you know, are still we hear a lot of booms in the background. Um, we went today actually to um, just outside of Kyiv to Urpin and, you know, hearing lots of bomb blasts all throughout the day. Um, so while, while it is feeling fortified generally, it, it certainly feels like it's also a place that is at risk. You know, there's this 40 mile long convoy outside the city. Is this something people are talking about? How much of the of the pivot right now is to what might be coming? You know, I think that the people who live here, um, I haven't heard them talk about that convoy because I think that they are just so focused on surviving day to day, you know, get, getting their family out of the city in, in many cases. Um, and, you know, certainly if they're coming from more difficult areas, just getting them out of those situations. So that's not something that I've really heard people speak about because they're just so focused on, on what's right in front of them. But, you know, it, it certainly is a concern. It's something we've been hearing about for, you know, probably a week now. Um, and, and so I know that it, it, it's certainly on, going to be on folks' minds if it's not already. We're looking at some images of, of people just trying to get away, Whitney. So talk to us about women and children versus men. I mean, is the city starting to feel like it's emptying of women and children? You know, I I think we don't see a lot of people on the street. Um, and the people that we do see are, are these territorial defense folks, um, most of whom are men. Um, you know, we do know that, that men uh, in a wide range of ages are not allowed to leave Ukraine so that they can sign up for the armed forces if they're able. Um, so, so we have heard lots of reports of women and children and, and older folks leaving. Um, we, we have seen some women who have stayed to sign up for territorial defense or stay back to help cook for territorial defense members or for the military. Um, so the people who are here are certainly trying to do what they can to, to help with the effort in any way that they can. Um, but, you know, the, the population is shifting given, given that lots of people are leaving. So, Whitney, stay with us. I want to play one of the dispatches you've sent back. This is about a Ukrainian couple that, despite this war, uh, they decided to have a wedding ceremony at a military checkpoint. And, and we'll see that this groom's wearing a helmet, the bride is wearing fatigues. Let's watch your piece. Важко назвати це щастям, безумовним в такій ситуації, але піднесення. Я дуже рада, що я нарешті побачила свого чоловіка від початку війни. Хоча наше серце розривається від болю за все, що відбувається в Україні з тими зруйнованими містами, з нашими друзями, розкиданими тепер від сьогодні по всьому світу, і з друзями, які зараз перебувають в небезпеці, в Ірпені, в Бучі, навколо Київ, де там на відстані витягнутої руки ведуться бої, їх не можуть евакуювати. Це така, знаєте, гірка радість трошечки. Це наш свідомий вибір, тому що ну, ми маємо захищати все, що ми любимо, є тут. І ми не маємо наміру це віддавати ворогу. І знаєте, якщо кажуть, якщо не ми, то хто?
the couple uh, have a plans long time to marry it and right now they doesn't have idea just a week ago to take the uh, uniform and take the weapons uh, in the hand they right now together and uh, actually decide to make a uh, wedding life continue and uh, the people people live and uh, love the love the help the war Оскільки ми за цим Максимом, з яким ми сьогодні співслужили на фронті з 2014 року, в окопах, в бліндажах, молимося, сповідаємо людей. Господи Боже наш! А вже коли почалася широкомасштабна агресія Російської Федерації проти України, то я вступив до батальйону «Спас-23». Що значить? Те, що значить будь-яка молитва під час війни. Тобто головне завдання капелана – бути поруч. Бути поруч із військовослужбовцем, який, який захищає батьківщину. Оскільки капелан є не комбатантом, він не має права брати в руки зброю через те. Зброя капелана – це слово, це молитва, це підтримка духовна і моральна наших воїнів. То йде війна, і ми налаштувалися на те, щоб перемагати разом з Господом і з нашою звитягою, нашою мужністю. A story reported by my guest, Whitney Shefty. Uh, Whitney, tell us more about what you witnessed and about the choices that families are making as war is either on their doorstep or already upon them. Yeah, you know, I, I think that this story is a good testament of the ways that life goes on here, but how all of it is very much colored by the backdrop of war. Um, you know, as you saw, they're wearing military fatigues in that wedding. And instead, apparently, normally in a Ukrainian wedding, there's a crown that's put on, on the heads of the bride and groom, but that's why they put the helmets instead. Um, so everything has, has just a little bit of that twist. Um, we also spent time in a maternity ward where the, the parents and the newborn babies are being moved to the bunkers every night to stay safe. And so they're, you know, lined up along the hallways that the babies are in bassinets inside of a cafeteria, um, all, all to keep people safe. But, you know, their lives do continue. Um, also went to a funeral. So, you know, <laughs> wedding, births and funerals, what, what, what more every day can you get in terms of life goes on? Um, but the funeral, um, the death was, was caused by, um, by the war. So, you know, that, that was especially difficult to see a family having to, to deal with this change, you know, losing a husband, losing a father and never being the same, never being able to replace that person. Um, it's, it's, you know, very heartbreaking to witness that sort of thing. Whitney Shefty, uh, wh where do you go from here? What happens next in your reporting? Uh, what happens next? I've, I've been here for over six weeks now. Um, and so I, I'm hoping that I get to go home. Um, I, I think my, my husband liked that a lot. Um, but, you know, getting home is, is not easy in this case. It's not like I can just go to the airport that I flew into six weeks ago. That's closed. Um, flights, flights are closed in Ukraine. So I have to find a way to get safe passage to, to the West somewhere and, and cross into a different country and um, make my way home from there. So we're still trying to figure that out. But that's, you know, all of these logistics are things that we have to consider when we're reporting here. That's right. And it certainly uh, speaks to all the logistics that families there are having to face as well. Whitney Shefty, we look forward to seeing you back here in Washington. Thank you so much for all your reporting and please stay safe. Let's talk to James Homan. You know, James, to, to see Whitney reporting from Kyiv give some uh, perspective on this, uh, you know, reality of life going on and yet life going on unlike it has before. Um, talk to us about uh, you know, what you're watching right now in Ukraine. Well, Libby, we heard from uh, some of the intelligence briefers during that hearing that there's really only about 10 days of food and supplies left in Kyiv. Uh, and it is a, a city that Russia wants to bring under siege to force capitulation. We saw that Churchillian speech by President Zelensky from Kyiv where he's staying. And so it is this dynamic where it is, it's a big city, it's a major city. In, in some ways it's comparable in size to Washington and the, this kind of the, the metropolitan area here. Uh, you know, there are still people who are camped out in the subway system. Uh, there are, uh, you, there's a lot of places in Kyiv that don't have power. 
Uh, there is concern about access to running water. So it's a, it's a dire humanitarian situation uh, in addition to the security situation. And, uh, and, and all, you know, all, all people, that, that wedding had been planned for some time. You know, women who are giving birth right now, nine months ago, didn't anticipate that their, their hometown was going to be under siege uh, when they were going into labor. So a lot of, of tough dynamics, a lot of choices where, you know, Zelensky and the Ukrainian government have banned men between the ages of 18 to 60 from leaving the country. They want them to stay and fight. And so a lot of families are separating uh, where women and children, uh, grandparents are taking their chances, moving west, trying to get into Poland. Uh, well, the men stay for what could be a prolonged insurgency in the capital city. Let's go to Rhonda Colvin, who's on Capitol Hill and was covering today's committee hearing. You know, Rhonda, uh, I was saying earlier, this was not a hearing to watch or listen to. If you uh, have a low threshold for anxiety about the state of the world, I mean, you just got such a raw assessment uh, from these intelligence leaders on uh, threat areas, what to watch for. But we also heard a lot of praise from members of Congress, and that does not always happen as they praise them for their advance work on Russia regarding Ukraine. So talk to us about your major takeaways on Ukraine, and, and then we can step back and go even bigger. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you've also seen that sort of spirit of bipartisanship uh, throughout the last month on the Hill, where Republican and Democrats seem to be on the same page about supporting Ukraine and, and thanking those officials, uh, those intelligence officials, for their work uh, in deciding uh, what are the threats that America faces, what's going on in Ukraine. And to your point about anxiety, you're absolutely right. I was in that hearing room, and within minutes of it starting, yeah, there, there is a lot of anxiety that uh, Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, uh, discussed. Uh, she put out uh, her assessment of what uh, Putin's mind set is right now. And I'm, I'm going to read to you a few quotes from the hearing. She said that uh, it's the intelligence community's understanding that Putin perceives that this is a battle he can't lose. Uh, CIA director William Burns said uh, Putin's been stewing for years and he's likely to double down and has no political endgame that they can discern. And then he also said, very frankly, it's going to be an ugly uh, next few weeks. So those are direct quotes from our intelligence heads. And mainly, this hearing was about Ukraine and Russia. That was uh, really the centerpiece of the questions that we heard from lawmakers. Many of them wanted uh, the public to see that they uh, had questions about where we go from here, what's been done already, and what's the, the large-scale assessment that the intelligence community wants people to be aware of. of. There are also uh, some other items that were discussed, too, and in fact, I received the 30-page the report that the intelligence community prepared for this hearing, and there were some things that they didn't talk about uh, that I found uh, interesting and notable. Uh, first of all, on cyber attacks, which is something that, of course, is uh, at the front of many people's minds, um, you know, we're thinking about Russia, but uh, in their report, they say Iran has growing expertise and uh, can conduct a cyber attack on the U.S. and its allies. North Korea is also becoming a place of concern when it comes to their ability to also do cyber attacks and disrupt our critical infrastructure. So that was a part of the written report. Not many uh, questions about those uh, things, but that is something that the Intelligence Committee wanted to focus on as well in their reporting. There was also a section about COVID, and uh, the intelligence community did say that they are still investigating the origins of the pandemic. They're finding uh, with low confidence that the virus was transmitted from animal to human, but they also are finding moderate confidence that it could have been spread by an accident at a, a Wuhan lab. So they say that that investigation is still ongoing, and they also note that Beijing is um, actively standing in the way of uh, their getting information on the origins of COVID. So there was a lot of information both in the report and also said there publicly in this hearing. Right. Thank you so much, Rhonda. I want to play a little bit of what we heard today that Rhonda talked about. This is the CIA director, Bill Burns. He, he's laying out what, in his agency's view, is Russian President Vladimir Putin's calculation, what he believed when he made the decision to invade Ukraine. Let's watch. First, that Ukraine, in his view, was weak and easily intimidated. Second, that the Europeans, especially the French and Germans, were distracted by elections in France and a leadership succession in Germany and risk averse 
Third, he believed he had sanctions proofed his economy um, in, in the sense of creating a large war chest of foreign currency reserves. And fourth, he was confident that he had modernized his military and they were capable of a quick, decisive victory at minimal cost. Um, he's been proven wrong on every count. Those assumptions have proven to be profoundly flawed over the last 12 days of conflict. President Zelensky, as, as you've mentioned, Mr. Chairman, as the ranking member mentioned, um, has risen to the moment and demonstrated courageous and remarkable leadership, and Ukrainians have resisted fiercely. That's the CIA director earlier today. Let's go to Olivier Knox, national political reporter, anchor of The Daily 202. So let's take that piece of sanctions, Olivier. You know, the CIA director uh, talking about the calculation Vladimir Putin made in terms of how his country could withstand and kind of buffer itself against sanctions, but also the appetite globally for other countries to stand together. Uh, you talk about sort of sanctions and, and the, the power of them in today's Daily 202. Tell us more. Right. Well, Vladimir Putin had built up vast foreign currency reserves. And so he thought that uh, if, if the world attacked the ruble, he could prop it up. He thought that he could uh, withstand uh, targeted sanctions aimed at various uh, sectors of the Russian economy. But as President Biden has talked about, the United States and its allies are imposing sanctions that far outstrip those, uh, the ones that were imposed after the 2014 uh, invasion of Ukraine, the first round in which Russia annexed Crimea. It's enormously important for uh, the United States and its allies to hang together. You don't want to see um, a, a fractured alliance when it comes to imposing these things. The, the latest round is, is really remarkable. President Biden, uh, the European Commission, and the United Kingdom all coming out and to varying degrees restricting imports of Russian energy products. So the United States is actually uh, banning oil and natural gas. The UK is banning oil but not natural gas. The uh, EU is banning uh, uh, natural gas, and they're all, they're all again, to varying degrees restricting that. What's remarkable about that is two things. One is it turns what was thought to be Russia's most potent weapon into, um, into a weapon for the West. Putin had always calculated that as the largest uh, energy exporter to Western Europe, Western Europe would never want to risk the lights going off, the heat going off um, by, by, uh, by opposing him too directly. Well, it turns out, that's, it turns out that that's wrong. Um, they are willing to do that. Um, it's it's going to be uh, also important to see what happens in terms of Russia's ability to earn money because they're going to lose they're going to lose a lot of money. There's an old saying that if if you owe the bank uh, ten thousand dollars, then they've got you. If you owe the bank ten billion dollars, you've got them. This is a little bit like that. Um, the late John McCain used to describe Russia as a gas station with nuclear weapons. That's a little more derogatory than I would go, but it illustrates the conundrum here for Vladimir Putin. He's got an enormously powerful country on paper with energy exports, with nuclear weapons. Uh, but whether or not he can withstand this latest wave of sanctions it remains to be seen. You know, one of the Republicans said, hey, are we incentivizing uh, rulers in countries to get nuclear weapons? Because apparently if you have a nuclear weapon and we think you're kind of crazy, we'll leave you alone. Um, what's the dynamic there? Well, that's kind of always been true, I'm sorry to say. Um, you know, that was that was one of the lessons uh, drawn from uh, from the 2003 invasion of Iraq. It was the lesson drawn from the uh, intervention in, in Libya. The idea has been internalized, very clearly internalized, in countries like North Korea, which is that having a nuclear deterrent is a way to keep the United States mostly off your back, at least militarily. Um, so it's not it's not new at all to this particular conflict. In fact, it's longstanding. Um, the, the the entire security architecture of the Cold War was based on the idea that the United, United States and Soviet Union could fight a nuclear war, but neither side could win one. We called it mutually assured destruction. So yeah, this is not a it's not a new concept. But 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 certainly there, there are probably some countries looking at this and thinking, well, you know, it might not be a bad idea for us to at least consider getting get, consider getting nuclear weapons. Uh, beyond that, you see a dynamic for, in places like the Middle East with Iran's nuclear program. You know, its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, are looking at that very nervously. And at one point, I don't know where things stand today, but at one point, uh, the Saudis were considering uh, developing their own nuclear program. So we are in a bit of a proliferation uh, danger zone at the moment. All right, Olivier Knox, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Missy Ryan now, who covers diplomacy and national security and the State Department. And she joins us from Estonia, where she is traveling with the Secretary of State. So, Missy, tell us about this diplomatic blitz that Secretary Blinken has been on for the past several days. Well, hi, Libby. Thanks for having me. So, Secretary Blinken is wrapping up this sprint that he did across Europe. Uh, he started last week in Brussels and then made his way across Eastern Europe to 
Poland, to Moldova, to the Baltic countries, including Estonia, which is where I am. And now he's on his way back. He's stopping off in Paris to talk to French President Emmanuel Macron uh, before heading back to Washington. And the message throughout really has been for him twofold. The first thing is the West is united against Putin's invasion of Ukraine. He's pointed to you know the sanctions that you and Olivia were just talking about, some of these other new measures. And then he's also talking about, um, secondly, the, um, the warning that he's issuing to Putin, which is that, that NATO will defend every inch of its territory. And that basically meant to, to tell Putin that he should not attempt to launch any further expansion of his assault beyond Ukraine, countries that um, need to form part of the Soviet Union or the Warsaw Pact. Secretary Blinken right now, Missy, you know, let's talk more about the specific commitments. Uh, uh, there's this show of unity that you're talking about, but where does that show of unity actually land in terms of in terms of promises, pledges and following through on things? Well, I mean, I think so far what what he can point to is this, this the coordinated sanctions. Um, he can talk about the military aid that's being delivered to Ukraine from Europe, from the United States in this unprecedented fa fashion. He did also announce some additional troop movements um, to uh, pointed to, you know, there's 500 more troops coming to Eastern Europe. There are still troops trickling in from some of these uh, recent tranches announced by the Pentagon. You know, one issue that has come up again and again over the course of this trip has been what the Ukrainians are asking for, which is uh, they say shut down the air. They want a, a fly zone that would be uh, enforced by NATO and they want fighter jets. So from the beginning, uh, NATO Secretary General um, Jan Stoltenberg said that that was not going to be possible. Blinken has said the same thing. Basically, they're saying a NATO no fly zone over Ukraine would be tantamount to uh, uh, declaring war on Russia. Basically, they say it would be inevitable that it would lead to an outright conflict between NATO and Russia, which is something that everybody wants to avoid. The question of the fighter jets is interesting because it sort of pushes the envelope of how far European NATO nations are willing to go in helping Ukraine. Uh, it seems like Poland may provide some of these Soviet era jets to Ukraine um, if the United States will agree to backfill or sort of replace them for Poland. And essentially that is going to be something that you know would help um, number one, satisfy the demand of the Ukrainians, also satisfy a demand that's coming from the US Congress for additional support, but hopefully do so in a way that wouldn't cross a line for Moscow that would prompt a direct retaliation against them, uh, against Poland or some other NATO country. Missy Ryan traveling in Estonia with the Secretary of State. Thank you so much, Missy. Really appreciate it. Good to see you. Let's go back to Rhonda Colvin for final thoughts here. Rhonda, you know, Missy just took us on that round the world tour. Um, a big thing that came up in the hearing was the question of NATO alliances and where that border ends. We did see some Republicans saying, you know, why one country and not another because of NATO? Uh, they, they seem to have their own answer, and yet they were bringing it up because they were saying their constituents were talking a lot about the question of why not save a Ukrainian when you would save a Pole? Yeah, and I think you may hear more of that. Uh, I do think that that's part of the discussion up here. And, you know, even the, the discussion around kitchen tables right now is it, what comes next? How should we be assisting uh, Ukraine in this as well as uh, NATO countries? So I, I think that this that will be an ongoing discussion. I think in terms of what's next here, I do know that in the next few hours, the House is going to take up that legislation that deals with banning uh, Russian oil imports. That's something, of course, the president announced earlier today that legislation will also include uh, giving the federal, uh, the executive branch, um, more ability to uh, enforce tariffs on Russia, as well as make sure that Russia doesn't enter the World Trade Organization. So that's something that Speaker Pelosi said will be on the House floor in a matter of hours. And then on the Senate side, they are looking at that uh, humanitarian aid package. They want to uh, pass that potentially over the next few days. It may may be paired with a government uh, spending bill uh, where the deadline uh, to avoid a government shutdown is Friday. So all of that may be voted on together. So that's sort of a glimpse of what's next in terms of Ukraine here on the Hill. 
Ron Colvin, thank you so much. Let's go to James Homan for final thoughts. James. Well, Libby, we heard CIA Director Bill Burns say during his testimony that it's going to be an ugly next few weeks. Uh, as the members head into their classified session, we uh, saw telegraph that the intelligence chiefs are going to preview what the U.S. is doing to support an insurgency as Russia gains deeper control of territory inside Ukraine. And as Burns said, uh, what happens in Ukraine matters beyond its borders. It really does shape the future of Europe. If Putin can get away with taking Ukraine, then uh, all the countries on the border are also in danger. And as all the intelligence chiefs testified, Libby, what is happening is being watched closely in China. Burns testified that the strong resistance from the Ukrainians and the strong response from the West have unsettled and rattled Beijing. So the world will continue to watch the fight as it unfolds. All right. Thank you so much to James, to Rhonda, and to all of our colleagues in the Washington Post newsroom. And thanks to you for watching with us. You know, we've been with you all morning as President Biden announced a ban on Russian oil imports. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky addressed the British Parliament. And House members got sobering details about Russian President Vladimir Putin and the situation on the ground in Ukraine. They also got that glimpse of global threats from the top intel chiefs. We'll continue to bring you all the key updates on Ukraine as they happen here at The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey, joining you from the newsroom, and I'll see you again soon. Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you.